afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Here. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Chair Howdigy. Here. Well, Madam Secretary, please indicate that all committee members are present. Um, Welcome everyone tuning in over the internet. Before we start, I would like to make some quick housekeeping announcements. Please remember all exhibits, written testimony and amendments must be submitted by noon on the business day prior to the committee meeting. People who wish to provide testimony or attend the meeting virtually must pre-register on the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance by emailing the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Zoom chat is reserved for committee business only. Members, please remember to keep your cameras on at all times. This will help ensure that we have a quorum unless you are stepping away for non-committee related business. Members and presenters, please remember to be muted at all times. Unmute yourself to speak and then promptly mute yourself when you are done. Thank you everyone. Let's begin with our agenda for today. Um, we have four bills for hearing and four bills on work session. I would like to give everyone listening a lay of the land. I'm going to start with the work session first. And then when we go into the bill hearing of the portion, I'm going to take the bills out of order. I will start with Assembly Bill 207, then with Assembly Bill 327, Assembly Bill 366, and we will end with Assembly Bill 45. Um, with that, we can go to the work session portion of our agenda. Um, the first bill we have on a work session for today is Assembly Bill 177, and we have Ms. Pascal of Thomas here to walk us through. Thank you, Madam Chair. Margie Thomas with the Research Division. The first bill is Assembly Bill 177 and revises provisions relating to prescriptions. It was sponsored by Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson and heard by the committee on March 10th. There are four proposed amendments by the sponsor. The first is to amend subsection one of section one of the bill on line eight to replace any language with languages to be identified by the State Board of Pharmacy based on demographic trends and projections for the purposes of requiring the board to, in determining the languages in which the information is required to be provided, base its determinations on demographic trends and projections. The second proposed amendment is to delete subsection 3B of section one of the bill and the corresponding language in subsection one of section one of the bill to eliminate any requirement that information other than information required to be included on a label be printed in a language other than English. The third proposed amendment is to delete subsection five of section one, which provides immunity from civil liability to a pharmacy or employee for injuries resulting from the translation of information by a third party, which is not the result of negligence, recklessness, or deliberate misconduct of the pharmacy or employee. And the fourth proposed amendment is to amend subsection 2B of section two to change the effective date to January 1st, 2022 for all other purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasloff. Thomas, um, committee members, any discussion? Assembly member Tolls. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I wanted to uh, thank the sponsor for <coughs> the, the perfect, bless you, um, wanted to thank the sponsor for conversations that we've had about um, concerns that were raised and I appreciate some of the amendments and uh, particularly extending the timeline. And I also definitely appreciate the value of um, what is trying to be accomplished with this bill, but I still have some concerns, um, particularly with the um, immunity being removed. And so, I will be a no, but I just wanted to get it on the record that I do appreciate my conversations with the sponsor in regards to this legislation and its intent. 
Thank you, Assembly Member Tolls. Um, members, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, I would accept a motion to amend and do pass. So moved. Okay, I have a, a amend and to pass by Vice Chair Carlton and a second by Assembly Member Flores. Flores. Thank you so much. Um, Madam Secretary, if you would please call a roll call vote. Oh, any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none. Um, Madam Secretary, if you would please call a roll call vote. Assemblywoman Carlton. Yes. Assemblywoman Considine. Yes. Assemblywoman Dickman. No. Assemblywoman Duran. Yes. <clears throat> Assemblyman Flores. Yes. Assemblyman Frierson. Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy. No. Assemblywoman Kasama. No. Assemblywoman Martinez. Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola. Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill. No. Assemblywoman Tolls. No. Chair Howdy. Yes. The bill having received a majority of the votes, the motion carries. Thank you. I will assign that floor statement to Assemblymember Marzola. The next bill on work session for today is Assembly Bill 190. Ms. Passlove Thomas, will you please walk us through um, Assembly Bill 190? Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 190 was sponsored uh, on behalf of the Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs. It was heard on March 17th, and it provides certain employees with the right to use sick leave to assist certain family members with medical needs. There is one proposed amendment by Barry Gold with AARP Nevada, and that is to amend the bill to explicitly exclude parties to collective bargaining agreements from the provisions of the bill. Members, any discussion? Okay. Oh, Assembly Member Kasama. I'm just curious, um, excluding it from um, collective bargaining agreements, is that typically already included in the other collective bargaining agreements? I believe we do have the bill sponsor here to answer your question. Hi, um, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray, Axrod for the record. Um, we actually, uh, that was brought up during the uh, committee hearing and we, attempted to just get it on the record that that was not our intent to have them included, um, but it was determined that we should actually um, spell that out. Thank you. Assembly members, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, I would accept a motion to amend and do pass. So moved, Madam Chair. I have an amend and do pass by Vice Chair Carlton. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Second by Assembly Member Hardy. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, Madam Secretary, will you please call roll call vote? Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Considine? Yes. Assemblywoman Dickman? Yes. Assemblywoman Duran? Yes. Assemblyman Flores? Yes. Assemblyman Frierson? Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy? Yes. Assemblywoman Kasama? Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola? Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill? Yes. Assemblywoman Tolls. Yes. Chair Howdy. 
Yes, thank you. Motion carries. I see the bill sponsor is here with us, so I will assign the floor statement to Assembly Member um, Bill Bray Axelrod. Hey, members, the third item on work session today is Assembly Bill 227. Um, Ms. Pasilov Thomas, will you present Assembly Bill 227 to us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 227 revises provisions relating to contractors. It is sponsored by Assemblywoman Carlton and was heard on March 22nd. There are no proposed amendments. Thank you, Ms. Pasloff Thomas. Members, any discussion? Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you. And I know there's been a lot of conversation about the amendments. The proposed amendment at the committee was not a friendly amendment. It was basically um, gut the bill type of an amendment. But I am working with some parties on trying to address some of the issues that were brought up. Unfortunately, with the time that's been involved, they're, they're currently working on it. I told them to keep working on it. So we are taking some of those considerations in in into um, you know trying to address them. But with the limited amount of time, I did not wanna ask you to pull the bill, but I will continue working on it because I believe it's important that we address the issues, but not allow someone to amend the bill to the point where they could drive a Mack truck through it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton. Uh, Assembly Member Tolls. Yes, thank you so much, Chair. And I would like to thank Vice Chair Carlton for being um, so accessible and so amenable to talking through some, some questions. And um, in regards to that process, I'm enthusiastic that those conversations are still going on and I'm hopeful to support on the floor. But it's my understanding that it's cleaner for the record to vote on what we have before us. So for today, I am a no and I'm hopeful that uh, those conversations can continue and, and get to a place that the stakeholders can um, come to an agreement. And again, appreciate Vice Chair Carlton for talking it through with me. Thank you, Assembly Member Tolls. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to do pass. So moved, Assemblyman Flores. I have an amended do pass by Assembly Again. Member Flores. Second. Do I have a second? I have a second by Assembly Member Considine. Madam Chair, and it was just a do pass. A do pass, correct. I apologize. <laughs> I had a motion to do pass by Assembly Member Flores, and I had a second by Assembly Member Considine. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, will you please call a roll call vote? Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Considine? Yes. Assemblywoman Dickman? No. Assemblywoman Duran? Yes. Assemblyman Flores? Yes. Assemblyman Frierson? Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy? No. Assemblywoman Kasama? No. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola? Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill? No. Assemblywoman Tolls? No. Chair Howdigy? Yes. Motion carries. I will assign that floor statement to our vice chair and bill sponsor, Assemblymember Carlton. The last item for work session today is a Senate concurrent resolution number one. Um, Ms. Pasloff Thomas, would you please present SCR one to at the committee? Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate concurrent resolution one urges employers in the state to provide personal protective equipment to employees to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It was sponsored by Senator Hardy and heard on March 3rd. There are no proposed amendments. Thank you, Ms. Pasloff Thomas. Members, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to do pass. So moved, Madam Chair. I have a motion to do pass by Vice Chair Carlton. Do I have a second? Second, Assemblyman Flores. Thank you, I have a second by Assembly Member Flores. Members, any discussion on the motion? 
Okay, seeing none, Madam Secretary, will you please call a roll call vote? Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Considine? Yes. Assemblywoman Dickman? Yes. Assemblywoman Duran? Yes. Assemblyman Flores? Yes. Assemblyman Frierson? Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy? Yes. Assemblywoman Kasama? Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola? Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill? Yes. Assemblywoman Tolls? Yes. Chair Howdy. Yes. Motion carries, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblymember Hardy. Okay, members, that completes the work session portion of our agenda. We can now go into the next item, which is bill hearings. We are going to start with Assembly Bill 207. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 207, and I believe we have Assembly Member Watts here with us today to present the bill. Welcome to the Committee on Commerce and Labor, Mr. Watts. When you're ready, you can begin. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it's, I'm glad to be with you today. For the record, I am Howard Watts, representing District 15 in Clark County, and I appreciate the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 207 for your consideration today. Uh, I am joined by David Brody of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And if it's all right with the chair, I'll speak briefly on the, what motivated me to bring this measure forward and what the intent of the bill is. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Brody to provide some additional background and context, and then we'll be glad to take any questions that the committee may have. In 2011, uh, before I was a member of this body, I assisted members of our LGBTQ plus community in the effort to update our state's non-discrimination laws to be fully inclusive. And at the in that effort, there were three real components to that, updating our laws regarding employment, housing, and public accommodations. Uh, those efforts were successful, making us an early national leader in legally protecting all Nevadans from discrimination. Nevada's current public accommodation law protects us from being discriminated against on the basis of our race, color, religion, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, sex, gender identity, or gender expression at places where the public is invited or where public use is intended including most businesses. However, uh, in, in the following decade, this law has not kept pace as a greater share of our interactions have moved from brick and mortar to the digital realm, a shift that has been clearly highlighted by the pandemic and I think is also demonstrated by the fact that this uh, very hearing is happening right now via Zoom. AB 207 looks to address this by clarifying that our public accommodations protections apply when people are engaged in e-commerce. Section one of the bill defines an online establishment and adds them to the definition of public accommodations for the purposes of our non-discrimination laws. Section two of the bill looks to mirror an existing exemption in those laws for some private clubs by defining and including private online chat forums with less than 1,000 members. It's clear to me that the importance of online venues in our daily lives is growing. While in many ways the removal of the human element in some of these transactions can actually reduce the opportunities for discrimination, when those interactions and decisions occur, I believe that it's critical Nevadans enjoy the same protections they would when they walk into a brick and mortar uh, business. To use a, a well-known example um, from recent current events, here in Nevada, you cannot be denied service at a bakery for who you are. However, if somebody was operating an online-only cake shop and they chose to do so, under our current laws, it's unclear what protection or recourse uh, Nevadans would have. AB 207 aims to cross that digital divide and level the playing field so all businesses operating in this state 
are open fairly to all Nevadans. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Brody. And then uh, as stated, we'll take any questions that you have. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting me. My name is David Brody and I lead the Digital Justice Initiative at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. The Lawyers Committee is a nonprofit, nonpartisan racial justice organization founded in 1963 at the request of President Kennedy to combat discrimination and inequality of opportunity. Our Digital Justice Initiative works on issues at the intersection of civil rights, privacy, and technology, such as discrimination in online commerce, internet enabled hate crimes, and discriminatory uses of personal information. Public accommodations laws are a cornerstone of civil rights protection in the United States. These laws are one of the key mechanisms used to end Jim Crow segregation and discrimination in everyday commerce. Many of these laws were enacted during the civil rights era in response to marches, sit-ins, and boycotts by black Americans and others seeking equal rights. Today, if a business posts a sign that says whites only, it should not matter whether it is written in ink or pixels. The discrimination is the same. The harm is the same. And under Nevada law, the legal consequences should be the same. Public accommodations laws are general purpose anti-discrimination statutes. They state that if a business offers goods or services to the general public, they must serve everyone regardless of race, gender, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, or other protected characteristics. Classic examples of places of public accommodations include hotels, stores, restaurants, theaters, buses, and stadiums. These laws, including Nevada's, typically prohibit two forms of discrimination. First, they prohibit covered businesses from denying service or charging higher prices on the basis of protected characteristics. Second, they prohibit violence, threats, or harassment by third parties when someone seeks to patronize the business. To give the historic example, these laws both prohibit a lunch counter from refusing service on the basis of race as well as prohibit a racist mob from blocking access to the lunch counter. Despite all of our advances on civil rights, discrimination and hate, discrimination and hate continue today. Sadly, we, we saw it just last week as hateful violence tore apart businesses run by Asian women in Georgia. Hateful threats and attacks on Asian Americans are spiking nationwide. These types of incidents interfere with equal enjoyment of places of public accommodation by intimidating our neighbors, especially senior citizens, from feeling safe when they go out in public. These harms occur online as well. Online threats, harassment, and intimidation frequently target people of color, women, LGBTQ individuals, religious minorities, immigrants, and people with disabilities. The Pew Research Center recently reported that 40% of Americans have experienced online harassment and that 25% have experienced physical threats, stalking, sexual harassment, or sustained harassment online. These hateful acts interfere with the right to equally enjoy online commerce, they discourage speech and civic engagement, and they cause serious harm. Businesses suffer when customers are not safe. When a user self-censors or stops using a website because they are being threatened, that user is deprived of their right to enjoy the services offered by that business. Discrimination also continues to infect the marketplace, where consumers of color continue to receive worse treatment and experience unequal access to goods and services. This discrimination increasingly occurs through online business practices. For example, Facebook, Google, and other major tech companies have been sued or investigated repeatedly for discriminating in their advertisements for housing, employment, and credit. Retail websites have been found to charge different prices based on the demographics of the user. Communities of color are targeted by predatory and low-quality low for-profit online colleges. And algorithms that set car insurance rates charge minority neighborhoods higher premiums than white neighborhoods with the same risk levels. Absent anti-discrimination protections, online businesses can refuse service on the basis of race, charge higher prices based on religion, provide subpar products based on gender or sexual orientation, or ignore the accessibility needs of people with disabilities. Public accommodations laws are meant to close these gaps. However, because most public accommodations laws were written decades before the invention of the internet, they do not always apply equally online and offline. 
AB 207 seeks to amend the state's public accommodation statute to ensure that Nevadans receive the same protections from, against discrimination from billion dollar websites that they do in a mom and pop corner store. Currently, five states explicitly apply their public accommodations laws to the internet, California, Colorado, New Mexico, New York, and Oregon. So Wall Street and Silicon Valley are already covered in their home states. Our analysis shows that another 17 states have laws that are likely to apply to the internet, but their courts have not addressed the question yet. For Nevada's statute, our research shows that it is unclear whether or not the state's public accommodations law applies to online businesses. This legislation clarifies that. Passing this bill would level the playing field between online and offline commerce, requiring online businesses to meet the same non-discrimination requirements as physical businesses and protect the rights of all residents. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. And uh, Madam Chair, I think that concludes our presentation. One thing I'd like to note very briefly is we are gonna have uh, some folks calling in in, in opposition and um, many of them, especially the chamber, the resource association um, have reached out and we've had some conversations and I am open to um, uh, suggestions to try and address some of the concerns that they've brought up and ensure that the language and the intent match up. So. I just wanted to recognize and uh, recognize that and uh, look forward to continuing those conversations moving forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Watts and Mr. Brody for your presentation today. We will now go to questions. Assembly members, do you have any questions for our presenters? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I do. Vice Chair Carlton, please. Thank you. And this probably comes from me being such a Luddite because I don't do things on the internet and along that line. So I'm just trying to wrap my brain around. I understand, I think, where you're trying to go. But if you could give me an example of one of the problems that have arisen that we're trying to solve, I think that would, um, would help me understand exactly what you're aiming at because I'm not a big internet person, don't do a lot of shopping on the internet, so I'm not really familiar with how this how this process works. Thank you so much for the question, Vice Chair Carlton. Howard Watts for the record. Um, one uh, hypothetical example that I gave in my testimony that I give is we're seeing more and more businesses that are based primarily online. Um, you know, I, I know, for example, there's a place in Las Vegas I go um, that does pizza and basically does it out of their uh, their house and has an online website where you can go and order and then pick it up. And so there's not really a brick and mortar location. And so the example that I gave in my testimony is if you have somebody who operates an online website and, and bakes cakes and uh, they get an order for a wedding cake for a, a LGBT couple and uh, get the order, get the payment, and then decide, well, I don't want, that's that. That's not something that I support or, or want to be involved with, and cancel the order um, with no, no reason, no explanation on the basis of discrimination. We would want that to be held to the same standard if somebody was treated that way when they go into a brick and mortar business. And then I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Brody briefly to uh, uh, give any examples that uh, he's seen in uh, in other areas. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, one, one type of example, like, like the assembly member was stating is you could, you could have a, a, a e-commerce site where they're selling some sort of goods and they just decide they want to charge women twice the price as men for the same product. Or you could, you could have a, a, uh, online service that is, uh, uh, like, on Facebook or, or, or Twitter, for example, where they're running advertisements for different types of products, uh, different types of protected economic opportunities like, like housing or employment. And on, in their system, you know, they might allow you to target based on the location of the user. And you might say, okay, I wanna send my ad to everyone in, in Las Vegas, but not this zip code or that zip code. And at least in Facebook system, it will literally draw a red line around the excluded zip code that you are not serving the advertisement to. 
Uh, and, and as we know from, from many years of, of research, that form of, of redlining has a uh, high correlation with, with race and, and results in racial discrimination. Um, and, and in the other vein, for the sort of other side of what public accommodations protects, uh, there's a large amount of research about the prevalence of online threats, specific, especially against uh, women and, and people of color, and it causes them to uh, uh, withdraw from engaging with in the public sphere at greater rates. And so, you know, if someone went into a department store and started screaming in someone's face, you know, they would get thrown out in five minutes and that kind of behavior would not be tolerated. But when it happens online, for whatever reason, people have sort of decided this is okay. We're, 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 you know, this is just the way it is. And as a result, there are people who are scared away from using services because they're afraid of being harassed and targeted and stalked, receiving death threats, receiving rape threats. Uh, and, and that is interference with their right to patronize those businesses, those websites. And, and th thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm just having a hard time, especially with the last comments, trying to figure out how all the pieces of this come together. Um, I've worked in with this discrimination issue within public accommodations ever since I partnered with Senator Parks back in 99 when we first started changing some of the things um, in, in, in statute. So I, I do understand the issue. I'm just having a hard time figuring out how it all fits in the internet world. So. I'll keep working on it, but thank you for the latitude to ask the question. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, Vice Chair Carlton. And I do want to clarify something because Mr. Brody, you gave the um, the example of um, employment and Facebook, but there there has been um, internet organizations or online organizations who have already taken steps because that's one of the things that Facebook doesn't allow when it comes to housing, mortgages, credit, or employment. They do not allow you to run advertisements based on gender age or zip code any longer or interest just to avoid that type of redlining. So that's not something you can do on their platform any longer. Um, but I do have another question from Assemblymember Kasama. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm certainly, um, you know, very, you know, in favor of the bill, the way it's written, all that. But I was concerned with um, David Brody's comment where you talked about the online advertising, um, because I had never thought until you said that. So for example, if I have a restaurant um, and I only want to advertise three miles in a radius from my restaurant, you made it sound like now that would be discriminatory if you don't blanket the entire, let's say Clark County. And a lot of people do advertising based on what they can afford and what is best for their business. And in my example, you know, they have so much money, $200 per month, and they do the closest people closest to their business. So now I'm concerned with unintended consequences based on your uh, comment that this would affect um, forcing businesses. How are they gonna advertise, uh, you know, when their uh, dollar limits are, are uh, limited? Thank you for that question, and, and it, let me let me clarify because it's a really Mr. important Brody, point. Would you just identify yourself for the record? It just helps our secretaries. Thank you. I, I apologize, David Brody, for the record. Uh, uh, let me clarify because it's a really important point. the The statute prohibits intentional discrimination. So when you're you're targeting your ad, you know you have to have the intent to exclude one of the protected groups. If what you're doing is saying I want to target the you know, the, the five miles around my business, that's a perfectly legitimate uh, way to do a targeting. And that, that's not based on, on, you know, some sort of personal animus against uh, uh, race or sex or, or what have you. That's just, this is a reasonable business practice. This is a reasonable way to make a decision how to target one's advertisements. And it's, it's not, it doesn't have the intentionality component that uh, the statute requires. And thank you. And this is Assemblyman Watts for the record. Uh, I, I appreciate that and just want to reinforce that 
that's one of the key pieces of intent is that uh, uh, of the bill is that there has to be discriminatory a discriminatory act. So, and we may hear some uh, other people ask or, or folks providing in opposition certain scenarios and and wonder how this might capture things where there is no human interaction, right? And that's one of the things I mentioned in my remarks is that oftentimes a transaction either goes through or it doesn't. Um, and it's essentially automatic. And if it gets turned down, it's because the payment method wasn't correct or something else um, just didn't work. And, you know, that would have absolutely no basis for a discrimination claim. There has to actually be a um, information that allows somebody to know or make an assumption about the the characteristics of, of the person that they're interacting with. So you have to have um, some idea of the race, gender, et cetera, either when you're advertising and creating two different types of advertisements um, or when you're um, uh, having a, a, a transaction occur. And then you'd have to use that information to make a discriminatory action, denying something, um, offering uh, differential pricing or or um, subpar services as a result. So that's one of the things I wanna make sure that we get on the record early is that this, the intent of this bill is it requires uh, a discriminatory action and intent from, from one human being to another. The, the difference is we're trying to capture when this happens through the medium of the internet, as opposed to inside a brick and mortar business and make sure that people have the same protections uh, no matter where they're at. Okay, thank you. And I, I would agree with that. Where in the bill I'm looking, I might not see it, does it say discriminatory intent? And maybe you don't have to answer that right now, but I, I can't seem to find that in there because that, that makes sense then. But um, that would just be a concern that we don't harm businesses that are equally, you know, providing to all people and they just have to, you know, they're, their service is just for this area or whatever it might be. This is uh, David Bright for the record. Um, my understanding is the, the existing law it, uh, includes the intent requirement and this bill only amends the, the definitions of what counts as a place of public accommodation. Thank you, I'll look at that, thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Kasama, for your question. I also have a question from Assemblymember Dickman. Thank you so much, Chair Hargi. Um, Just kind of a quick question. I appreciate uh, your presentation and the fact that you're wanting to deal with technological advances and our evolving economy. But um, I just wondered, you gave a lot of examples of hypotheticals and things that could happen or might happen. I was wondering if you'd have any more specific examples of something that, that actually has happened. Thank you for the question. Uh, Howard Watts for the record. Uh, you know, I'll say that this, there was not a specific instance here in the state of Nevada that led me to bring this forward. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the, again, that the law is equal and, and protects people whether whether they're online or in a brick and mortar establishment um, for the same type of transaction. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Brody if there's uh, any specific examples that have been noted. Although one last thing I'll note is that, um, and, and Mr. Brody can probably speak to this as well. There are not many times when public accommodations law is actually invoked and leads to complaints and litigation. Um, and I would say that not having this protection uh, in place in our state law so that people know about it uh, probably has a further chilling effect. So if, if somebody gets discriminated against online and it's kind of just the way it is or they don't know how to prove it or if there's any legal basis to do take any action on it, um, then they're not gonna file a complaint with NERC, for example, and we're not gonna have any data or examples here that we can provide. So um, I believe that um, by putting this into place, I don't think that there's uh, necessarily a, 
a raft of this behavior, but once we have something in place, then we'll be able to gather the data um, on when and where it does occur. And thank you, David Brody, for the record. Um, I, I can give you a, a very recent example that was uh, just in the news about a, a week or so ago. Uh, the, the, the news outlet, The Markup, which does uh, tech investigative journalism, reported that uh, public service announcements from public health agencies about COVID-19 uh, were disproportionately under-delivered to Black Facebook users. So uh, Black users of Facebook were getting about one-third to one-half as many PSAs uh, with really important COVID-19 uh, public health information from, from the Department of Health and Human Services and other public health agencies. Uh, uh, as, a, as a result of, uh, most likely, of the way that uh, the platform's advertising system is, is structured. Um, there have been other studies where uh, researchers, have, researchers have identified uh, differential pricing in online, uh, webs online retail websites. Um, that was uh, first reported back in 2012 by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there is a, a great deal of research surrounding uh, 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 algorithmic discrimination in, in insurance rates. So, so car insurance rates, uh, uh, people that live in uh, minority neighborhoods get charged higher premiums than people that live in white neighborhoods. Uh, and to the extent that, that those, those sort of insurance companies are often not operating from brick and mortar establishments that are often these days operating online. Um, and and there's, a, there's a number of, of other examples. I'd be happy to, to follow up with some more uh, concrete sources uh, if that would be helpful. And this is Simon Watts for the record. I would just like to add one more thing very briefly, which is that as Mr. Brody noted, uh, Laws with this level of protection exist in, in uh, a few states, among them California and New York. So uh, a lot of uh, large technological platforms are already adapting their policies and procedures. Chair Howdy mentioned um, some of the adjustments that have been made at Facebook. So we're, you know, we're seeing less of this as the digital realm evolves and as some of these laws take effect, this would really just make sure that those protections are in place for the state of Nevada. And I wanted to very briefly just mention for Assemblywoman Dickman's previous question that you'd want to look at NRS uh, 651.070, which uh, is the provision that says all persons are entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any place of public accommodation without discrimination or segregation on the ground of, and then it lists the protected categories. And so that's where it includes those terms, discrimination or segregation, which would require uh, intent. Thank you so much. Quick follow-up, Chair? Yes, follow-up, Assemblymember Dickman. Thank you so much. Just wondering if you could tell me how this would affect commerce from businesses outside the state. Thank you for the question, Howard Watts, for the record. Uh, so if uh, a transaction happened outside of the, uh, between somebody inside the state mm -hmm. and based outside of the state, yeah. uh, if there was discrimination against somebody um, inside of the state, then they would have access to uh, the recourse under our, under our current uh, statutes. And I don't know if Mr. Brody wants to speak about the complexities of interstate uh, issues but uh sure david for the for the record um the, the the bill is probably not breaking new ground here uh you know to the extent that in the past you know mail order businesses had served people in the state but been based out of state or banks or or insurance companies were, were serving people in the state but based out of state there's there's various other scenarios in which you know, these issues have likely, you know, been addressed and, and, and already applied. Uh, so, you know, to, as, as the assembly member Watts said, um, 
you know, if so, if a business is is based headquartered outside of the state and is providing services uh, to your residents, uh, you know, anytime anyone is doing business in the state, they are availing themselves of the state's laws. They're they are and and the the you know privileges and, and immunities and accommodations of the state. And you know, one of the the requirements of doing business in the state is you have to subject yourself to the state's laws. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your questions, Assemblymember Dickman. I have questions from Assemblymember Tolls next. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I have um, three questions, so I could ask them really quickly, or I could ask the, them one at a time. What would you prefer? You, you can ask them together, Assemblymember Tolls, quickly if you can. Sure. So, um, one, and forgive me if I missed this, but has this law been enacted in other states that might help with some of the clarity around what this actually looks like? And then the next two questions, because I'm um, haven't I'm not as as familiar with the public accommodations, would be how would this be monitored and enforced, and what are the penalties? Thank you for the questions, Assemblywoman Tolls. Howard Watts, record. Uh, I'll have Mr. Brody provide the, the exact list of states that this uh, similar policies are enacted in, but there are, I believe, five were mentioned uh, during his presentation. Uh, in terms of how this would be monitored and enforced, um, it, it really is something that would arise on a complaint basis. So somebody would have to be the subject of discrimination um, and, and compile evidence of that discriminatory act under and this also ties into the second part of your question under our public accommodations law there is a private right of action so if somebody has been discriminated they can file suit uh if for anyone who is actively trying working to restrict somebody's equal enjoyment and access to goods and services the it is considered a misdemeanor and so uh, the state could bring something forward and i believe um there is also a provision for a complaint to be filed with the Equal Rights Commission or NERC. Um, so those are the remedies that exist in current law for public accommodations. But essentially, there would not be outside enforcement. It would be based on a complaint being brought forth, and there would have to be evidence provided along with that complaint. Thank you, David Bright, for the record. With regard to your first question about uh, other states, uh, Currently, uh, California, Colorado, New Mexico, New York, and Oregon apply their public, accommoda public accommodations laws to the internet. The District of Columbia recently passed legislation in December, but it has not come into effect yet. Um, and there are another 17 states whose statutes are highly similar to, the, the, to one of the states that does apply their law online. Uh, and the issue just hasn't uh, come up in their courts yet. So the, of these 17 other states, uh, we, we believe that their laws likely would apply to the internet if uh, the question arose. And then there's about, um, I'm, I'm looking at my, my report here, it, I think there's about 12 to 15 states or jurisdictions where the, the law is unclear, maybe it applies, maybe it doesn't. Uh, Nevada is in that list. Uh, and then there are uh, six states where the law is unlikely to apply to the internet, only two states that I'm aware of where the law explicitly does not apply. Uh, and then there's six states um, that do not have a public accommodations law at all, or at least not a general purpose one. Thank you so much for those answers. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assembly Member Told. Next, I have Assembly Member O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Brody, Ms. Dickman sort of took my question, but I need clarification on it, if I may. On misdemeanors, I have a business or somebody has a business out of state. Somebody in Nevada purchases it or goes to purchase. Uh, the person 
for whatever reason identifies and they refuse to do business with them, how do you file a misdemeanor complaint on somebody in, say, Maine, when the businesses or when the uh, I'm here in um, Nevada purchasing? Uh, David Brody, for the record. Uh, so I am I am not expert in, in Nevada criminal law, so I, I don't want to speculate too much on, on how you would prosecute such a case. But I imagine that uh, your prosecutors have uh, procedures in place for bringing criminal charges against uh, people who are out of state when such circumstances arise. Um, in, in terms of, of civil, uh, a, a civil complaint, um, you know, it, it would be similar to uh, any, any other instance in which someone who is out of state committed a, a tort or other sort of, of uh, civil infraction against uh, an in-state resident. You would, uh, you know, you, you would either file a, a complaint with your civil rights commission or, or go to court. Uh, and uh, jurisdiction is one of the things that the court would adjudicate. And Howard, watch for the record. I'd, I'd also note that in general, it's uh, a civil remedy is usually what would be sought uh, in these in these instances. Thank you, Mr. Watts. Thank you, Mr. Brody. Madam Chair, would it be out of line to ask our legal to identify the process on filing a, how the misdemeanor complaint would be filed out of state if it even can be? Mr. O'Neill, I'll make sure our legal gets an answer to the committee um, for us. When he is not with us today, but as, um, he has been answering questions because he watches the committees as he's drafting it. So I'll make sure he gets an answer to us. I appreciate that. Could we also include what the pro in short terms, not long legal terms, uh, the process on the uh, civil, uh, where the tort would be filed, whether it be here in Nevada, that be a federal case, or go to where the business is. Those two clarifications, please. Yes, Mr. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for the time. Hey, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I am going to move into the Testimony and support portion of the bill hearing broadcasting. Can we go to the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify in support? Yes, Chair. To testify in support on AB 207, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in support on AB 207, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for support at this time. Okay, next we will hear testimony in opposition. Can we check the telephone line, please? Yes, Chair. To testify in opposition on AB 207, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in opposition on AB 207, press star nine now to join the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 528, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 528, please press star six to unmute. Again, caller with the last three digits of 528, please press star six to unmute. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good 
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, MOR, AD, KHAN with the Vegas Chamber. I appreciate the conversations that we have had with the sponsor and the proponents of the bill. The Chamber does not support discrimination and supports equal access, treatment, and protections for all Nevadans. As we have shared with the bill sponsor, we are trying to understand how the bill would affect those online establishments that are fully automated with no human interaction or involvement. Our concern is how it would be determined that an online establishment would be in violation of existing state laws as it applies to equal access and protections. We are working on, on proposing amendments that we hope will provide greater clarity for businesses, but would preserve the intent of the bill. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Merrickin, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 139, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Hadegay and committee members and Assemblyman Watts for bringing this bill. Misty Grimmer, G-R-I-M-M-E-R with the Ferraro Group representing the Nevada Resort Association. The NRA is currently in opposition to AB 207 as drafted, but mostly from a position of needing further clarity on how it is currently drafted and how it would affect us. As was mentioned by Assemblyman Watts, I reached out and we have also communicated with Mr. Brody and look forward to continuing those conversations. We are concerned that the bill as drafted may be imposing requirements on websites that go beyond our understanding of the goal of the bill. Of course, all of our properties already fall under all the anti-discrimination laws and the ADA requirements. We support the goals of the bill to ensure that all people are treated fairly in the marketplace, whether it's in person or online, and we will continue to work with the sponsor to achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Grimmer, for your testimony. I'm broadcasting next caller, please. For those who recently joined the call, if you would like to testify in support, excuse me, in opposition on AB 207, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 114, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Greetings, Chair Hadegi, members of the committee. Uh, Amber Stidham, that's A-M-B-E-R-S-T-I-D-H-A-M on behalf of the Henderson Chamber. We too also want to um, say thank you to Assemblyman Watts for bringing this bill forward and being open to working with stakeholders. Respectfully, we are also opposed. I also want to be clear that the Chamber certainly does not advocate for discriminatory viewpoints on it for itself or on behalf of its members, but we do feel compelled to protect our members' rights and the rights of all of our business owners. A few notes I wanted to share today. We do believe that much of what AB 207 covers is already protected under federal law, including the Civil Rights Act and Americans with Disabilities Act, which protects designated groups from discrimination in places of public accommodation. Um, some of the most recent case law in the Ninth Circuit Court um, also holds that ADA applies to website and mobile applications. And uh, uh, based on these rulings, we really believe that Nevada's anti-discrimination laws already provide a lot of these protections for public accommodations that are under this bill. Our chamber is also um, concerned about the bill definition of private online discussion forum as it's written. Limitations in section two referring to a limit of not more than 1,000 members and excluding, op excluding operators who regularly receive payments from non-members as part of their business, we believe is potentially unconstitutional. These limitations could create a severe intrusion on the certain businesses' rights to expressive association, which we believe is protected by the First Amendment. And while it's possible that this language might violate a business's constitutional rights, the fact that it could violate those rights we believe could be an issue at some point in this bill if it's passed as written, we'd be open to having some discussions. Thank you so much for hearing our concerns. Thank you, Ms. Stidham, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 653. 
Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, um, gentlemen, Hedigi and the members. I totally apologize. I was trying to find my star uh, nine to um, support AB 207. Can I still um, go ahead or do you want me to call back? Uh, yes, you can go ahead and we'll just move your testimony into the support category. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, I we, we um, this is Dora Martinez, D O R A M A R T I N E Z. Um, I'm representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. We're people with various disability, and we support this bill. Um, it may not cover what the opposition we're talking about fully, but I believe it is a start. And she was referring to the federal. Um, ADA, but this is more to hit Nevada statewide. And, you know, I mean, people don't discriminate against the the Franklin and, and the Lincoln. So I think that, you know, money. So I think that people with um, who, who is anybody who is willing to um, patronize in their business should be able to um, have that opportunity. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Martinez, and it's okay. We are all still getting used to this virtual world. Madam Secretary, if we please just make sure to add her testimony in the support category. Um, broadcasting, if we could take the next caller in opposition. Caller with the last three digits of 528, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, members of the committee, Madam Chair, Liz McMiniman for, with the Retail Association in Nevada. I apologize, I couldn't get myself unmuted last time. Um, I would just like to say that the Retail Association has been working with the bill sponsor. We appreciate the work he's doing with, with the industry and we thank him for considering some of the amendments that we have and we would like to continue working with him. Um, and that is it in case you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMinniman, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller in opposition. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Um, can we check to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in neutral on the telephone line? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral on AB 207, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in neutral on AB 207, please press star nine now to join the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. And Assemblymember Watts, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'll keep this brief. I know you have a, a long agenda. Uh, thank you again for your consideration. Uh, I look forward to working with uh, some of the folks who called in uh, on an amendment to clarify and align the intent. Uh, for those who have worked on public accommodations law uh, before, you know that we, we've done some other things to make sure that ladies' nights and other things are, are uh, protected and we'll make sure that we get this uh, uh, worked out in a way that provides clarity and, and uh, is the Nevada way. Uh, the other thing I just note very quickly on um, some of the remarks about uh, federal law and federal case law, um, my personal opinion is that uh, case law can change. Um, of course, we are working to, uh, everyone I think is working to, to update things to accommodate our new reality with the, the presence of e-commerce. Uh, I just want to make sure that our state statutes um, are, are solid so that people can enjoy, again, the same uh, access to goods and services free from discrimination and have the same legal protection, whether they're in a brick and mortar or online, and that there is no intent for this to have uh, put any additional uh, restrictions or requirements on existing brick and mortar businesses in the state. So um, we hope to be back 
uh, before you soon for a work session with the proposed amendment. I thank you all for your time and consideration and we'll ask for your support for Assembly Bill 207. Thank you, Mr. Watts, Assembly Member Watts. Mm -hmm. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 207. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 327, which requires certain mental health professionals to complete continuing education relating to cultural competency. We have Assembly Member Torres here with us to present the bill. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Ms. Torres, when you're ready, you can begin. Thank you, Chair Howdy, Vice Chair Carlton, and members of the committee. Um, for the record, I am Assemblywoman Selena Torres, representing Assembly District 3. Thank you for allowing me to present AB 327 for your consideration. This measure requires mental health professionals to complete continuing education relating to cultural competency and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Based off of my conversation with stakeholders, I am presenting a conceptual amendment. It has been emailed to all members of this committee and has already been posted on Netlist. Today, I will also be co-presenting with Dr. Sandra Gray, a licensed psychologist, and Ms. Denisha Mingo, CEO of Mingo Health Solutions and a licensed behavior analyst. Last session, we passed two bills, Senate Bill 364 and Senate Bill 470, which requires medical facilities licensed in Nevada to follow various procedures surrounding cultural competency in the workplace. These procedures include anti-discrimination policies and the annual completion of a certified cultural competency training. As many of you know, cultural competency training focuses on skills and knowledge that value diversity, understand and respond to cultural differences, and increase awareness of providers and care organizations' cultural norms. Last summer, Dr. Sandra Gray, who is a licensed Nevada psychologist, reached out to me expressing her interest in ensuring that all licensed mental health professionals in Nevada also receive training on cultural competency, not just those persons employed by a medical facility. We know that effective health communication is as important to healthcare as clinical skill. There is strong evidence that cultural competency training for healthcare and mental health professionals improves providers' knowledge, understanding, and skills for treating patients from culturally, linguistically, and socioeconomically diverse backgrounds. To effectively serve these diverse communities, we need healthcare practitioners who understand, respect, and value all of the cultural differences and perspectives towards mental health. I'm gonna begin with the bill summary and then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my co-presenters. AB 327, as amended, requires a psychiatrist, physician assistant, practicing under the supervision of a psychiatrist, nurse, marriage and family therapist, clinical professional counselor, social worker, clinical alcohol and drug counselor, alcohol and drug counselor, or problem gambling counselor, to complete at least two hours of instruction concerning cultural competency and diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of his or her continuing education. As you'll notice in the conceptual amendment, the change to section two, subsection three C makes it so that the amendment applies to all nurses. This was upon the request of the Nevada Nurses Association. Additionally, the amendment requires that boards and associations that oversee continuing education units shall accept the training received under NRS 449.103. This amendment will allow for the employees and medical facilities that are required to complete the training in accordance with SB 364 from the 2019 legislative session to use the training already mandated. Madam Chair, with your approval, I will go ahead and allow for Ms. Denisha Mingo uh, to provide some additional remarks. Yes, Assembly Member Torres. I believe you're mis muted, Ms. Mingo. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for carrying this bill, Denisha Mingo, for the record. I am the owner of Mingo Health Solutions. I've been in business five years and been a rehab practitioner in Nevada since 2011. I'm also a, a Nevada native, Las Vegas native, and I am in support of this bill. It is critically important in my history working in the, in the field with people who have mental and behavioral health issues. I've worked with largely um, underserved minority populations and the workforce in Nevada is not reflective of the population it serves, and especially the population who is at most at risk for mental and behavioral health needs, including those who may even have autism, which is a population we serve at MHS. And in my experience, I've seen and or heard feedback from a lot of minorities who say that they do not get mental health support because A, they don't trust that the practitioners understand what they're going through. And then secondly, many who have 
tried to access mental health support felt judged or misunderstood by their provider, and that deterred them from continuing with treatment. Likewise, being a professional and having many friends who are also professionals and used to working in um, environments that are largely white or just non-minority, so definitely having no issue with you know being the one or two few minority in such environments, they have also shared with me that when they attempted to go out and get treatment for therapy and counseling, that they did not feel, again, understood or that they could connect with their practitioner. So I'm in support of this bill specifically because since the workforce is not reflective of and because I do a lot of advocacy and awareness in the community, I get so many people reaching out to me looking for providers who meet whatever their cultural needs are. And it's important that when any person walks into a therapeutic room, that they feel safe, that they feel understood, and they feel that they're not going to be judged and that their culture and background is going to be taken into account. And so for our current professionals, many who are well-intentioned, sometimes it's just lack of knowledge. And with requiring these CEUs for continuing education, especially as we continue to diversify here in Nevada and other relevant cultural things come up, we want to make sure our practitioners are just knowledgeable and aware. Um, one last thing I'll say is that being a business owner, I have seen uh, therapists who have worked for me, um, very passionate about working with all communities and even those underserved, just literally not have the skills to properly assess for some of those needs that many of our uh, minority populations experience and therefore the treatment is not properly targeted just because they haven't assessed. And when I've sat with them one-on-one -on -one and I said, oh, well, did you look at this? Did you look at this? And they said, well, oh, I didn't notice or I, I didn't know. I didn't see that need. And so this bill is just specifically making sure that we continue to be proactive and uh, reactive actually to, a, to an extent in Nevada to support um, every person who wants to um, access any type of mental health care uh, needs. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mingo. Thank you. And at this time, at the at the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce Dr. Sandra Gray, a licensed psychologist. And I don't think I mentioned in the initial uh, presentation that licensed psychologists are also included in this legislation. Um, so, Dr. Gray, when you're ready. Hi. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself here. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Torres. And um, so as she mentioned, I'm a licensed psychologist here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been in the mental health field for over 12 years. And with all my professional experience being here in Clark County, I own and operate a group practice, Innovation Behavioral Health Solutions. I specialize in trauma, working with communities of color, immigrants, and in neuropsychological assessment of conditions, including autism, ADHD, learning disorders, traumatic brain injury, among other, other conditions. One of the things that I've learned in the last 12 months is that the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of mental health. Not only has this been a global health crisis, but a mental health crisis as well. The pandemic has led to increased rates in anxiety, depression, suicidality, and undoubtedly an increase in abuse and domestic violence rates. Black Indigenous People of Color, or BIPOC, have been among the most significantly and negatively impacted groups by the pandemic, not only with regard to the COVID-19 rates, but also in terms of mental health, given factors such as racial injustices that we've seen across the country and that in turn have exacerbated already existing anxiety and depression that's associated with racial and other traumas. Most recently, we have seen violence against the Asian American community and historically and currently against black and brown communities. However, this isn't something new. BIPOC communities have consistently experienced health disparities throughout our history, including barriers to access to treatment paired with systemic oppression that further aggravates the problems we face with regard to our mental health. Nevada is a remarkably diverse state with nearly half of the population identifying as racially and or ethnically diverse, according to the 2019 U.S. Census. Notably, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, extends beyond race and ethnicity, including intersections of ability, socioeconomic status, or SES, gender, and uh, sexual orientation. Close to 9% of Nevadans under the age of 65 identify as experiencing a disability, over 12% live in poverty, and over 5% of Nevada's adult population identify as LGBTQ. 
Licensed mental health providers are often not equipped to provide culturally competent treatment to diverse populations, given that providers are not informed of culturally relevant factors, and therefore they can't be culturally responsive without training and education. This presents many implications for diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes of these populations, given health disparities, barriers to treatment, and cultural factors that further stigmatize mental health. For instance, individuals growing up in low SES are more likely to experience trauma, higher rates of stress, and are more likely to experience adverse childhood experiences, all of which negatively impact mental health. The rates are even higher for BIPOC and often result in the criminalization and or misdiagnoses of these populations. Non-Hispanic Blacks are about twice as likely to experience psychological distress, yet half as likely to access treatment. It fares worse for our native populations who are two and a half times more likely to experience serious psychological distress. Researchers have found that Latinx and African-American adults are more likely to experience PTSD and have more severe and chronic symptoms compared to their white counterparts. And these high rates of PTSD have been attributed by researchers to the lack of culturally competent trauma treatments paired with the lack of understanding of how discrimination and racism impacts both Latinx and African-American. Children of color are more likely to be misdiagnosed with a behavioral condition such as oppositional defiance disorder, conduct disorder, and ADHD compared to their white counterparts. With regard to ability and neurodiversity, children of color are less likely to be diagnosed with autism at an early age because they're more likely to be missed or misdiagnosed despite research indicating that the earlier the diagnosis, the better the prognosis. Similarly, African-American men are more likely to be misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, which has been attributed to implicit biases by clinicians, which result in the overpathologizing of African-Americans. Mental health disparities and the misdiagnoses of BIPOC raise significant concerns in clinical settings. Overall, men, women, and children of color are more likely to be misdiagnosed with a psychotic, learning, or behavioral disorder. Thus, understanding implicit biases, microaggressions, cultural differences, barriers in adequate health care, stigma in mental health pertaining to underserved and marginalized communities, as well as understanding historical contexts associated with mistrust of providers, could reduce mental health disparities and misdiagnoses of BIPOC. It can further assist us with identifying and raising awareness regarding social justice issues and how BIPOC may be affected by those issues. Licensed mental health professionals provide services to vulnerable, marginalized, stigmatized, and underserved communities. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that providers are promoting and advocating for equality, equity, and inclusion through culturally responsive service delivery. Furthermore, it is in the best interest of the public, the stakeholders, particularly our BICOP communities, that we ensure competence by our mental health providers by requiring continuing education in DEI for license renewal in an effort to minimize health disparities in these oppressed populations. Research indicates that lack of cultural responsiveness may result in lack of sensitivity to cultural differences in symptom presentation, consequently leaving clinicians vulnerable to their own implicit biases, stereotypes, and negative attitudes to certain populations due to their lack of training and culturally responsive assessment and diagnosis. Continuing education requirements are intended to ensure that licensed mental health professionals stay current, informed, and provide the best possible care for the individuals whom we serve. We must practice cultural humility, which is a lifelong journey. We must understand not only the unique challenges faced by diverse communities, but also comprehend cultural background, value systems, and appropriate evidence-based treatments that address mental health challenges and from a culturally responsive and intersectional perspective. Diversity education is a necessity and an opportunity for us all to learn more fully about groups who have been historically marginalized based on race, ethnicity, sex, gender, or sexual orientation, among other social identities. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gray. And at this time, Chair, um, we're ready for any questions and I'm excited for the conversation, the discussion the committee may have. Thank you, Assemblymember Torres. Okay, it looks like I do have some questions and we are going to start with our Vice Chair. Vice Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So um, I want to understand, I, I totally support uh, continuing education for folks. We've done this a number of times over the years, depending upon what the board was. This, this is very overarching. So I just wanna try to get some details. So when we're talking about this two hours 
of continuing education. Some boards renew by the year, some boards renew by two years. So as you considered how you would track and monitor that, that would be my first question. Um, is this education available in the state and what is the cost? Because having folks having to go get continuing education and the cost towards their license. I know I was very lucky when when uh, I wanted to do this training with, with, with my staff, I was able to find someone who uh, was willing, since we were a nonprofit, willing to do it for free, but I'm not sure that's available to professionals as far as their licensure goes, because it has to be an accredited training program. So I'm just wondering if it's available in the state and online and, and what the cost might be, if you could answer those questions. Thank you for the question, Vice Chair Carlton, through the chair to the vice chair. Um, uh, so the, the first part of the question, um, the way the legislation is right now, um, because we're changing, it used to say six hours, and then it said, um, if you looked, there were certain sections where it said three hours because it was annual. Um, so with the, the intention of the amendment is then to split that if they have annual licensing. Um, and I'm sure that legal will help us with that when we get closer to, when we get closer to a work session. Um, the next question, um, was whether or not this training was available. And the answer is, uh, you know, with every board that I've spoken to, there are continuing education units that are available in um, DEI and culturally responsive um, education for that profession. Um, so the training is very much available. Um, nonetheless, it would require that the boards kind of determine what, you know, what is eligible, um, what training counts as eligible um, for that. So for example, um, in my conversations with one of the associations, um, there's CEUs on uh, gender dysphoria. That would be a com that would be a training that the board could then determine would be eligible. And then there's also training on, you know, cultural competency in diagnostics. Um, and that might be a type of training that would be available. So that would be at the leisure of um, the boards to kind of determine which courses exactly, but there's a variety of different topics um, that would be applicable to any of the professions included here. And as far as the cost, I think that that would be the same cost as their CEUs right now, but I, I imagine Dr. Gray might be able to speak more to that. Yeah, Dr. Sandra Gray for the record. Um, yeah, the, it would be comparable to everything else that we're currently um, paying for in terms of continuing education. Uh, I don't see why this would be more. Um, or less than than any current uh, training that we are attending. And to be clear, um, this is out of the requirements that they're currently doing. So for example, if they're required 20 CEUs, they're not be, gonna be required 22. They're gonna be required to complete 20 CEUs and two of those will have to be in cultural competency. That adds a lot of clarification because when I read the bill, I really didn't see that It almost. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm really glad the Assemblywoman said that because every time we do this, we add a little bit more on, a little bit more on, a little bit more on. And it gets to the point where people are doing their job and then they're getting their CEUs and they may get to see their family once or twice a month. So um, I just wanted to make sure. And that would be up to the board then as to how they would want to substitute it for other CEUs. Thank you for the question, Vice Chair, through the chair to the Vice Chair for the record, uh, St. Louis Horace. Um, so yeah, the board would be able to, just like how they have done with uh, suicide. So I, I made this legislation very similar to AB 93, which passed in the 2015 legislative session. Um, and that was the current majority leader, um, Benitez Thompson's piece of legislation. Um, and what that did was require suicide training and then the, the boards um, determined what, what that looked like. Um, and so that would be, it would be very similar to what we did in 2015. Thank you. I'm, I'm just always cautious about adding and adding and adding. So thank you very much. And assembly member Torres, you can go directly to the members. Okay, assembly members, committee members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, let's move into testimony and in support of assembly bill 327 broadcasting. Can we check the telephone line to see if there is anyone in support? Yes, Chair. Sure. To testify in support on AB 327, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 202, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Paige Barnes, P-A-I-G-E-B-A-R-N-E-S. I'm with Crowley and Frado Public Affairs here today representing the Nevada Nurses Association. We are here in support of AB 230, or I'm, I apologize, AB 2, AB 327, I apologize, as amended. I want to thank Assemblywoman Torres for her work on the bill and willingness to collaborate. The Nevada Nurses Association believes this bill is very timely. Our nurses have experienced the benefits of the LGBTQI training provided in a hospital setting, which was implemented at, at the result of 2019 legislation. We believe that AB 327 is the next logical step. As Assemblywoman Torres mentioned, we requested the expansion of the CEUs to apply to all nurses. We believe that all of our nurses and all of our patients will benefit from the education on cultural competency. Nevada has a vast array of cultures in the state. Diversity is part of what makes Nevada home to so many communities. It is so important that our nurses have the education to treat each patient, patient as an individual with respect to their cultures. Again, I want to thank Assemblywoman Torres for bringing forward the amendment to apply the bill to all nurses and adjusting the CEUs to two hours to be aligned with past legislation, such as suicide prevention. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 013, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Lauren Zita Santos, L-O-R-E-N-Z-I-T-A Santos, S-A-N-T-O-S. -S. I'm the outreach coordinator for One API in Nevada. When I was 15, I had a mental health crisis and I had to undergo intensive psychiatric care at Seven Hills Behavioral Health Hospital. Since then, I've had to meet with several mental health professionals to talk about my struggles as a second generation Filipino American and as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Many mental health professionals I spoke with lacked fundamental knowledge about AAPI issues. I would have to dedicate time during these sessions to explain the basics. Each, ses each session that was not successful not only cost time, but cost money. The lack of cultural competency is a barrier for me and members of the AAPI community. In fact, of all groups, AAPI adults are the least likely to seek mental health services. By having a cultural competency training, it ensures that members of the AAPI community are heard, understood, and properly cared for. I urge you to support AB 327. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support on AB 327, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 611, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chairwoman Haudegui and uh, for Thank you, Assemblywoman Torres, for bringing up this bill. My name is Eric Jang, representing Asian Community Development Council as Director of Outreach, uh, E-R-I-C, last name is J-E-N-G. First of all, I want to ditto the last testimony from uh, Ms. Santos that was raw, powerful, and we're here to support our community members. Uh, uh, Nevada, right now, a three million people state, Asian, and Pacific Islander are growing with the fastest growing minority group with about 300,000. And we want to be here to dispel the minor model minority myth. We are not a monolith. There's approximate 30 ethnic groups speaking over 50 languages here in Nevada. For us, this is the right step towards more health equity, understanding of cultural sensitivity, and this is a good bill. Right now, like the last caller said, we are Asian Americans, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are the least likely to seek help for uh, mental health. And I think a lot of it come from cultural stigma, come from uh, underreporting, come from different uh, issues that needs to be addressed. And this bill is the right step for it. So again, thank you again for this opportunity. And uh, we fully support this bill. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Jeng. 
Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 085, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. You are unmuted. Caller with the last three digits, 085. Hello, thank you. My name is Alyssa Cortez, first name A-L-Y-S-S-A, -S -S last name C-O-R-T-E-S. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Alyssa and I'm the Program Associate for Silver State Equality, a statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. And we are in full support of AB 327. This week is LGBTQ plus health awareness week and mental health plays an important role in the health of our communities. AB 327 is timely and prepares mental health professionals to serve diverse communities. About 4.5% of the US population identifies LGBTQ with nearly 40% experience experiencing issues with mental health. Licensed mental health providers are often not equipped to provide culturally competent treatment to diverse populations like the LGBTQ plus community. And often providers are not informed of culturally relevant factors and therefore cannot be culturally responsive without training and education. AB 327 ensures that all mental health providers complete the training that they need to serve diverse populations in our state. And that's why Silver State Equality supports AB 327. And I respectfully urge you to do so as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 653, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon, um, Chairwoman and the committee, and thank you so much for uh, Selena Torres. My name is Dora Martinez. I feel like I live there. Um, I'm calling in support of AB3. I'm sorry, I forgot the number of AB. Um, we, like just an example. Um, thank you so much. Bless you. So an example, um, you may have heard I am blind and we went to a um, an ER with my daughter who is 13 and um, the nurse, talk to her, but not to me. And my daughter was telling her, you know, why don't you talk to my mom? Nothing's wrong with her, she's just blind. So this competency will include people with disability awareness um, and, and all the other awesome stuff that you guys are talking. Thank you so much, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Martinez, for your testimony, for being here with us today. Broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, next we will hear testimony in opposition. Let's check the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify. Yes, Chair, to testify in opposition on AB 327, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in opposition on AB 327, press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits of 099, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello and good afternoon, committee people. And thank you, uh, Chair Hadegi, for allowing me to speak. My name is Jake Wiskirchen, standard spelling on Wiskirchen. Just kidding, it's W-I-S-K-E-R-C-H-E-N. Uh, representing myself, and, but I do have a background in chairing my licensing board and actually presented in front of this committee just one session ago. So I happen to agree with everything that the bill's presenters outlined, uh, all of it actually, as well as all the testimony in advance. I will add that I work specifically with firearms owners who are some of the most stigmatized individuals when it comes to mental health treatment because of continued uh, perceived encroachment upon gun rights, nearly all firearms owners, including police and military, without being retired, are suspicious of therapy because they report receiving the same exact judgment as listed by uh, the bill presented. What was that? You need to stick within the parameters of the bill, Mr. West Kirchum. Speak to the yes, bill we're hearing. I, yeah. Assembly Bill 327. Yeah, 327. Yep. 
So with regard to um, cultural competence, I actually teach cultural competence to clinicians about the stigma of firearms owners to try to get us more uh, welcoming. Um, and I'm embarrassed by all the testimony, having been a clinician for 12 years and logged about 20,000 hours. My concern on this echoes that of Vice Chair Carlton, wherein um, the legislature seems to be encroaching upon the autonomy granted to the boards to create the content uh, by which they would govern these uh, continuing education units. So our uh, collective behavioral health professions have been in existence for nearly six decades now, dating back to 1963 when the Psychological Board of Examiners was created. And until about 2017 or 2015, all of the content was deferred to the licensing boards to be created. Uh, in the last uh, couple of sessions, though, two of the last three at least, the legislature has added continuing ed credit for uh, suicide intervention and now this cultural competence. And I'm uh, considerably concerned about if the legislature continues to restrict what we're able to study, we won't actually be able to study what's necessary to perform good care. Um, I, uh, I'm a little concerned also that we're, um, we're entering a slippery slope, this being this, the second step of which, wherein if we continue down this road, uh, we'll be squeezed out of studying things that we like to do with regard to treatment intervention. So um, I stand in opposition based on the idea that this could open up the door for more, multiple um, vendors, if I, if I may say so, to come in and lobby that their courses that they sell are necessary for citizens. Yes, ma'am. Move on to the next caller. Thank I you. will. Yep, absolutely. And um, I, I would like to say that I am. Yes, and if you have any written remarks, you can submit those to our committee manager um, to share with the committee members. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wiskirchen. Broadcasting, can we move on to the next caller in opposition, please? Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Can we move on to those who wish to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral on AB 327, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of three, eight, Four, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you for the record. My name is Alexis Tusi, A-L-E-X-I-S, last name T-U-C-E-Y, Deputy Administrator with the Division of Child and Family Services. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing me to testify in neutral to this bill. The changes that are proposed in AB 327 uh, including the proposed uh, amendments to the bill uh, actually align with the Division of Child and Family Services goals for implementation of the system of care and their guiding principles, which includes cultural competency. For those that are not familiar with what system of care is, is it's a coordinated network of community-based services and supports organized to meet the challenges of children and youth and their families. Those core principles within the system of care include family-driven, individualized, strength-based, and evidence-informed, youth-guided, culturally and linguistically competent, provided in the least restrictive environment possible, community-based, accessible, and collaborative and coordinated across an interagency network. Again, just wanted to appreciate uh, the efforts of AB 372, or 327 and testifying in neutral. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Tusi, for your testimony broadcasting. Do we have anyone else on the line for neutral? Caller with the last three digits of 570, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Leah Case, L-E-A-C-A-S-E, -E, here today on behalf of the Nevada Psychiatric Association in neutral. We just wanted to extend our gratitude to Assemblymember Torres for meeting with us extensively yesterday and working on the amendments. We're especially grateful for the amendment requiring boards to accept the training that some of our physician members receive under NRS 449.103, 
related to cultural competency. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Case. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 685. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Hattie and members of the Committee on Commerce and Labor. For the record, this is Daniel Burrow with our Gentum Partners on behalf of our client, the Nevada Academy of Physician Assistants. Today, we are testifying as neutral to Assembly Bill 327. Founded in 1977, NAPA's goal is to not only improve the quality of health care by increasing accessibility throughout the state, but also to give a voice to the physician assistant profession through education and advocacy. With over 1,200 PAs working in every facet of the healthcare industry, we are determined to bring high quality health care to Nevadans. We appreciate the intent of the bill and the sponsor for bringing this legislation forward. We would like to thank the bill sponsor for clarifying some of the provisions related to AB 327. We reviewed the conceptual amendment brought forth today and are neutral on the substitution of CMU requirements to include cultural competency and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for your time. Mr. Perot, would you please um, spell your last name for our committee secretary, please? I don't see you signed in on our um, registration form. Caller with the last three digits of 685, please press star six to unmute. Sorry about that, Chair. Um, let's spell my name. It's D A N I E L. My last name is P I E R R O T T. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Assemblymember Torres, would you like to give any closing remarks? Uh, I'll, I'll keep them brief. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for hearing out this legislation. And I urge you to support AB 327. I, I think that this will help expand access to better quality health care uh, for all Nevadans. Thank you, Assemblymember Torres. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 327. Okay, hey, members, moving on to our next agenda item, which is a bill hearing on AB 366. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 366 which revises provisions governing mental health records. We have our own committee member, Assembly Member Tolls, here to present the bill. When you're ready, Assembly Member Tolls, you can begin. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, members of this esteemed committee. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Jill Tolls. I represent Assembly District 25, and today I'm here to, rep to present Assembly Bill 366, which exempts record recordings of certain training activities from the retention, maintenance, and disclosure of healthcare records by mental health professionals. We'll provide background information. And then I will invite Dr. Whitney Koch Owens, and who is the president of the psychology board, and Lisa Scurry, who is the executive director of the board, to present the details of AB 366 with your permission, Chair. Thank you. So the use of recordings to advise, mentor, supervise, and train new mental health pr practitioners is a widely accepted practice. Trainees may record audio or video sessions with clients for their clinical supervisors to review both prior to the meeting for supervision and jointly in supervised sessions. The use of recordings in sessions like these can benefit the clients as well as the trainees. However, those persons who consent to audio or video recording, it is important that the destruction of the physical artifacts of those recordings take place at the earliest time appropriate. Destroying these artifacts ensures the audio or video recordings are not included in a patient's medical record and only the written record of the visit remains in accordance with state law. Specifically, NRS 629.016 requires all practitioners of healing arts, including the professionals covered by this bill to retain healthcare records as defined in NRS 629.021. Assembly Bill 366 excludes recordings used for training purposes from the definition of medical records in order to allow for their destruction as soon as appropriate. And thank you, Chair and members of this committee. With that, I would like to turn it over to my guest presenters to walk through the specifics of the bill. Yes, member tolls when they're ready.
Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Scurry. I'm the executive director for the Nevada Board of Psychological Examiners. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak about Assembly Bill 366. And thank you to Assemblywoman Tolls for bringing this bill forward. As Assemblywoman Tolls explained, the existing statute in the state of Nevada requires that all recordings of patients that contain clinical material done for any purpose must be maintained as part of that person's medical record. The Board of Psychological Examiners is requesting that recordings of treatment made for the purpose of clinical training be exempted from this requirement, which would allow for destruction of certain mental health training videos. A standard practice in the training of future psychologists is that video recordings of psychotherapy sessions are often made, reviewed by training supervisors, and immediately destroyed. Training clinics do not maintain these records for a number of reasons. A primary reason is because maintaining records of highly personal and in the case of mental health issues, potentially highly stigmatizing content goes beyond what is legally mandated for recording of treatment. It increases the potential impact to individuals in the unlikely circumstance of a data breach of a HIPAA secured server, server um, and is, a, is prohibitively expensive to maintain these records for UCD training university excuse me, training clinics, which are often cash strapped. As the records are created for the purpose of training, these recordings are exempted from need for entry into healthcare records in the vast majority of jurisdictions around the country. Not making and using these recordings has negative implications for workforce development in Nevada. Um, also, the Nevada Board of Psychological Examiners did reach out to other mental health boards, including the Social Workers Board, the Drug and Alcohol Counseling Board, and the Marriage and Family Therapy Board. The social workers did not oppose. Um, the other two boards were in support. Um, and also with me, Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to introduce Dr. Whitney Owens, who is our board president, and she, I'm sure, will take any questions. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Owens. Thank you, Assemblywoman Tolls, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Whitney Owens. I'm a licensed psychologist and the president of the Board of Psychological Examiners. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about Assembly Bill 366. So it's important to note that the standard of practice in the field of psychology for training and supervision of students, um, that this has been the practice for years. Psychologists have been using audio and video recordings for training purposes only and have not included them in the patient record for reasons already discussed. When people seek mental health services, they're coming with the understanding and belief that what they talk about in therapy will be kept confidential. If patients were to believe that an audio or video recording of their therapy or assessment session would be a part of their healthcare record, they're likely to not seek services or significantly, significantly alter what they are willing to tell their psychologist, which would diminish the benefit of the therapy, as well as decrease access to mental health care in our state. Um, additionally, psychologists wouldn't be able to provide the training necessary um, for students in order to um, make sure that they're the best psychologists that they can be. So the purpose of this bill is to ensure that NRS 269021, um, health care records defined, matches with our standards of practices and ensures the confidentiality of people who seek psychotherapy or psychological assessment services. Seeking treatment for mental illness is already challenging for many. We want to ensure that our NRS doesn't create further burdens or barriers to those seeking mental health services. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Uh, Assemblymember Tolls, uh, is there more presentation or are we ready for questions? Thank you for asking, Chair, and know that concludes our opening remarks and open for questions from committee members, and we'll um, direct them to our two guest presenters today, Dr. Um, Owens and Director Story. Members, any questions? Okay, and I just have one clarifying question. So, so currently the training the trainings are recorded and they are destroyed or they're not destroyed, they're held. And you guys need this change in NRS to then be able to destroy them. Uh, Whitney Owens for the record. So that's a great question. So because it's been standard of practice for years, um, psychologists have been um, having their students record their sessions either by video or audio, and then the sessions are destroyed. Um, in 2019, we were approached by a psychologist at the University of Nevada, Reno, um, who, you know, the, some of the attorneys at UNR came to them and said, 
hey, according to NRS, you, we have to start keeping all of your training sessions and we have to, you know, you, you have to upload them to a server and we have to keep them. Um, and of course, the psychologist came to our board and said, how do we manage this? Because this isn't this isn't standard of practice and this isn't what we do. Um, so we uh, obtained an, uh, our attorney general's opinion on this and decided that uh, there was a bit of conflict in our standard of practice in NRS. And so we're working on just cleaning this up. Okay, perfect. So you guys weren't, the NRS required the videos to be kept, but it had been the practice of the industry to destroy them for reasons that you stated. And now to be in alignment, you're changing NRS to what the current practice of the industry is. Okay. Do you know when, do you know when that was put into statute, the requirement to keep the recordings? Was it put in there for a reason or? Whitney Owens, for the record, my best guess, I don't know when it was put in. My best guess is that it's just old language that nobody's ever caught um, and didn't realize that, you know, that it was in conflict with our standards of practices. Um, to my understanding, nobody does keep audio or video recordings for the exact reason that we've talked about. Um, you know, anybody going to, to therapy, if they thought that somebody would hear their exact words um, or that those words could come back later in either litigation or after their death, nobody would ever go to therapy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Owens. I appreciate that. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will move into testimony and support. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line, please? Yes, Chair. To testify in support on AB 366, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Okay, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition? Yes, Chair, to testify in opposition on AB 366, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in the neutral position? To testify on neutral for AB 366, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Assemblymember Tolls, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate this, uh, the time given for this hearing. And I know it seems like just a small technical cleanup, but I think it could have some big implications for those involved. And I would urge and appreciate your support. Thank you. I will now close the hearing. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 366. Our last bill hearing today, committee members, is Assembly Bill 405. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 405, which revises provisions relating to insurance. I believe we do have the Division of Insurance Commissioner uh, Richardson here with us to present. So when you're ready, um, Ms. Richardson, the floor is yours. Committee members, I do want to make a quick statement. There had been um, various amendments to Assembly Bill 45. At my request, I did request that Commissioner Richardson not present every amendment if the amendments were deleting sections and only speak to us about what was left in the bill um, that we would be passing. So Commissioner Richardson, when you're ready. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon, Chair Haldegi and Vice Chair Compton, members of the committee. My name is Barbara Richardson, and I'm the Insurance Commissioner for the state. And I do realize it's Friday afternoon, um, so I will try to be um, as succinct as possible. Um, but I am here to present Assembly Bill 45, and it's a bill that addresses a variety of topics related to insurance regulation in the state. So um, we do have some pretty technical um, 
bits of information. So um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll stand ready at the end to take care of those. So Title 57 of the Nevada Rise Statutes um, contains 59 chapters um, governing insurance. And I did provide the committee with a table that, um, that gives the Title 57 chapter numbers along with their applicable titles. And you should have also received an explanation table for AB 45, and that contains section by section summary of the changes in current language being proposed. It also includes the reason for each of the changes being proposed. Um, we thought that might be helpful. We do have 13 amendments being proposed for AB 45, and the language for each of these amendments has been submitted to the committee as well. So I'm gonna address each of the first proposed 11 amendments as I discuss the applicable sections of the bill to which they apply. So the first 11 we are proposing have come through numerous discussions with the industry. At the end of my presentation of the initial language of AB 45, I'm gonna summarize our two larger amendments, which are number 12 and 13. And they provide, provide um, new language to this bill and that's gonna be used for accreditation purposes. And it's basically to support consistent financial solvency controls on insurance carriers across state lines. So please feel free to interrupt me should you have any questions during my presentation or I can take questions at the end at your preference. And at your permission, I can walk through the sections of the bill. Yes, Commissioner Richardson, please. <laughs> Thank you. So this is Barb Richardson for the record. So section one, real quick, is just the introductory language and uh, noting that statute's being amendment or amended. So section two, um, we actually um, put in um, some language here, but uh, we're propose proposing to remove this section with amendment number one. And so that should take care of the entire section two um, as originally submitted. Section three is intended to consolidate licensing bond requirements under NRS 679B, so that all Title 57 licensees are required by statute to carry a surety bond in favor of statute in Nevada as a condition of holding the license will have uniform surety bond requirements. So bond documentation requirements um, currently vary by license type. And this creates challenges and inefficiencies in regulating those licenses. In addition, the surety carriers have to develop several different types of bond forms to meet the various language requirements in Title 57. So these proposed changes are, will allow for simplified license, license applications for the entities required to hold a surety bond. We'll also help the division to be able to more efficiently and maintain and enforce the requirements moving forward across the licensees. And in this particular section, the division submitting amendment number two, and this is gonna provide clarification that section three only applies to licensees where existing statutes already require a surety bond as a condition for holding that license. There are no new requirements put in place for that. Section four eliminates the requirement that for service of process, the serving party leave two hard copies of the service notice with the division. It also clarifies that the service may be made by leaving the underlying documents with the division, as well as clarifying the process that the division must take once such service has been made. Further changes to create a uniformity for the service of process um, to other chapters in Title 57 are requested by our proposed amendment number three. This proposed amendment also allows the division to, to forward the documents to the appropriate broker or insurer by email, thereby, thereby creating a faster and less costly process. This change is being proposed to support electronic service of process changes that have already been embraced by the state of Nevada and the insurance industry. Sections 5, 14, 51, 56, 72, and 73 remove the fee language from various individual licensing chapters, and they add those references to NRS 680B to consolidate all licensing fees under this fees and, ch and taxes chapter in the, um, the statute for insurance or the, the title um, 57 statutes for insurance. This allows for greater ease of reference for regulators and for our licensees. This change is not adding any new fees, but is rather just moving them from miscellaneous individual title 57 chapters. Section six and sections 46 through 53 had originally been proposed to focus on licensing processes for service contractors. However, there was a, um, a Supreme Court case um, that came out of Nevada on March 4th, 2020, which um, gave us the information that we needed to um, deal with the service contract provider statutes. So to address this um, and to deal uh, and to make sure that we're following the um, Supreme Court program or, or processes and their decision, 
um, we're proposing amendments for a number six, which delete six and section 46 through 53 of the bill dealing with service contract providers. So this is um, going to be a long group. Um, so section 7, 10, 17, 21, 36, 37, 39, 45, 49, 52, 55, 60, 64, 71, 74, 78, and 79 are updating the bond requirements within the specific licensing chapters to follow the surety bond requirements that I discussed in section three. There are two amendments to the original proposed language in these sections. Amendment number seven to section 55 clarifies that a natural person licensed as a title agent is exempt from the corporate surety bond requirement if they work for a title insurer or by a firm or corporation that is licensed as a title agent because there's already bond requirements in place for those. Amendment 10 amends section 64 to match the same language for surety bond requirements for dental entities, which are licensed under NRS 695D. These entities are already required to hold a surety bond. Section eight adds a reference to NRS 682A.179, which provides the terms under which a mortgage on real estate qualifies as an equity interest in relation to rated credit instruments. This reference is um, bringing the statute up to date with accreditation standards and the latest model language of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And again, that's to support solvency, financial solvency requirements across state lines. So this is another longer um, grouping. So sections 9, 13, 15, 16, 19, 20, 38, 40, 41, 70, 73, and 75 update license renewal language so that the expiration occurs on the last date of the month in which the license was issued. Currently, renewal provisions vary across license type, and this change will simplify requirements on our licensees, especially those who hold multiple license or a license across several jurisdictions. It also allows the division to streamline internal renewal process, including issuing notices and handling expiring license. It also provides clarity and consistencies for our licensees. And at this point, we are looking at, um, at the division holding um, over 200,000 licenses um, that would fall under these different um, section and um, updated license renewal um, types. Section 11 removes the requirement to list all members of a managing general agent to be provided on the license and instead adds a requirement to designate one individual responsible for an agency's compliance with relevant laws. This change is consistent with similar license types. We're proposing amendment number five to further clarify the division's intentions for those languages or language changes in NRS 683A.140 and to make them clear and more concise. Listing all members of an entity license, license or of an entity that's li already licensed is hard for a licensee to maintain as these employees may change over um, time or at any time. So this is a burden on the industry that provides no regulatory benefit. Section 12 establishes clear renewal requirements for managing general agents. The current licensing provisions for managing general agents does not address license renewals. So a licensee does not have the same additional protections to reinstate their license if the renewal payment is late as, as they do, would if they were another type of licensee. Section 12 adds the language that applies to most other licensees under Title 57. Sections 15 and 54 establish late renewal provisions for insurance, consultant, and escrow officers licensees respectively. These sections also update the expiration date of both licenses to the last day of the month to match the other licensees. These changes are consistent with similar Title 57 license types, but we did add um, under Amendment 55, or excuse me, under Amendment 5, um, removing the language from NRS 692A.103 that had originally conflicted with our proposed changes in Section 54. Section 18 removes language regarding the automatic refund of license fees upon denial of a license for motor vehicle damage appraiser. This is consistent with other license um, types in Title 57. That being said, I do want to um, uh, let the legislators know that the Vision's current fee statutes still do provide for the return of erroneously collected fees under NRS 680B.120. So that is not being removed. Sections 22 through 35 
provide rules for stop loss insurance that provides excess loss coverage for self-funded plans. So section 35 relates to a type of stop loss policy for healthcare providers who insure against loss of income through their network contracts with payers. Currently, Nevada statutes do not explicitly allow for stop loss insurance coverage and the related rules are instead contained within the Nevada Administrative Code. Sections 42 through 44 clarify that maternity benefits are not just for the mother, but for the pregnant person. This language is needed to make Nevada statutes consistent with gestational carrier laws and the Affordable Care Act to address surrogacy coverage. Section 57 requires an insurer or insurance group to annually file any amendments to the previous year's corporate governance annual disclosure or to expressly state that no changes were made. This language was inadvertently omitted when NRS 692C.3504 was adopted in 2017. So the division is proposing amendment number eight that deletes the word also in the third line of the language that's in the bill right now to clarify that there are not two filings required to be submitted, but rather just an amended version of the original annual disclosure. So section 58 is a clarifying language uh, or section that provides the captive insurer dormancy provision by clarifying it applies to captive insurers that are not transacting the business of insurance during dormancy. It also clarifies that differing tax and filing requirements apply once the certificate of dormancy is issued and that dormancy lasts until a certificate expires or is revoked. The language also clarifies that upon the expiration of the certificate of dormancy, the carry must be in compliance with all the provisions of NRS 694C that are applicable to holders of an active certificate of authority. Section 59 allows captives to use federally charted credit unions in the same manner as federally charted banks. It also provides that the division may perform periodic reviews of the qualifications of captive managers and be able to disqualify those that would be considered unsuitable under NAC 679B.039. And this usually applies to people who have been convicted of felonies um, after they've already gotten their initial license. 61 through 63, Clarify requirements related to confidentiality of information submitted in connection with a health rate filing. This will help create uniformity across all health plans and carriers regarding the provisions of the NRS they are subject to. The division is proposing amendment number nine that corrects the quoted subsections to only include the relevant statutes of the NRS. Um, one section got added by in error. So section 65 and 63 clarify that risk retention groups are subject to registration renewal in Nevada and to determination of hazardous financial condition pursuant to NRS 680A.205. This is in keeping with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners accreditation requirements. Um, and it's due to the fact that RRGs policies, which had not been thought to happen originally, but we have now um, discovered across the, the nation that these policies are being sold to policy holders across state lines. So you wanna make sure you're protecting not only the policy holders in your own state, but the policy holders in other states as well. Section 67 through 69, make changes to the financial regulation of prepaid limited health service organizations. The provisions make these organizations subject to the defined limit of investment and financial examination provisions, otherwise applicable to Nevada domiciled life and health insurers. It also clarifies requirements related to the confidentiality of information, of information submitted in connection with the health rate filing and the applicability of the requirements related to the review of the health rate filings and that to make sure that they apply as intended and in conformance to the division's current procedures. Amendment number nine also corrects the subsections in section 67 as the first one did. Section 76 provides certain employees of the fraud unit within the division, the powers of peace officer for their duties. This change allows the division to fully effectuate its charge of investigating criminal fraud complaints, sharing and accessing criminal information or referring actions for criminal prosecution. This is similar as the powers of peace officer given to the special investigators employed by the attorney general's office. Section 77 and 80 through 85 have been put into the proposed bill to move the certification and financial review of employee leasing companies from the division of industrial relations to the division of insurance. This language was mirrored in um, Senate Bill 55, which has been amended. So we're proposing removing sections 77, 80 and 85 through amendment 11.
Section 86 provides for the repeal of NRS 692A.1043 and NRS 695F.180. These sections are no longer needed since the requirements for bonding and investment respectively are being updated as part of this legislation. And then section 87 provides the effective date of the sections within the bill. As I mentioned earlier, the final part of my presentation on AB 45 is to address amendments 12 and 13. Both amendments provide new rules regarding the financial regulation of insurers, and they're based on recent updates to the National Association of Commissioners model laws. The first is the credit for reinsurance. And the second is the Holding Company Act. So these changes are necessitated, necess necessitated by federal preemption dates, which were included in the bilateral agreement between the United States and the European Union on prudential measures regarding insurance and reinsurance, commonly known as the covered agreement. And this was signed by the United States, the European Union and Great Britain. The new model language has been set as an NAIC accreditation requirement for all states beginning in 2022. State insurance regulators have historically required non-U.S. reinsurers to hold 100% collateral within the U.S. for any risk they assume from U.S. insurers. The Credit for Reinsurance um, Act itself and our amendment number 12 primarily concerns the elimination of additional collateral requirements for reinsurers domiciled in the European Union and the United Kingdom, provided certain regulatory criteria are met. It also allows for reinsurers domiciled in qualified jurisdictions to obtain similar treatment to those jurisdictions that are subject to the covered agreements. These changes provide those jurisdictions to give US-based reinsurers the same treatment and recognition afforded by EU countries pursuant to the covered agreement. Therefore, our revisions include the requirement that the qualified jurisdiction must agree to recognize the state's approach to group supervision, including group capital that the EU has already agreed upon. Amendment number 13 contains the language from the Insurance Holding Company System Regulatory Act and Regulation. It is intended to provide U.S. solvency regulators with an additional analytical tool for conducting group-wide supervision. And this is in light of the new requirements under the, govern, uh, under the covered agreement. This amendment will provide key financial information on an insurance group. And this information assists regulators in understanding the financial condition of non-insurance entities that are part of a larger holding company structure, and then information that assists in understanding whether and to what degree an insurance company may be supporting the operations of non-insurance entities within their holding company. Adoption will further aid U.S. insurers operating in the EU or the United Kingdom. This concludes my introduction of AB 45, and I stand available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Richardson. Uh, members, I know this was this bill was a lot to dissect and in its original format and then with the added amendments. So um, we are available. Thank you for being available for questions, Commissioner Richardson. And I know that we have a few. I'm going to let the committee members go first and then I'll, I'll ans ask my questions. But let's start with our vice chair, Carlton. Thank you. Oops, let me. Oops, am I back? Okay, here we go. Somehow I turned myself off, I apologize. So um, Commissioner, I guess I'm gonna go to the uh, fraud unit, which I had a lot of concerns about last session um, in 19, uh, how that was actually gonna be handled. Um, you're now asking, we gave you two positions for that. You're now asking for limited powers of a police officer. If you could expand upon that, because I'm always very cautious about putting peace officers and post-certified folks in different areas. There's a lot of other things that go along with that, like heart and lung and a lot of other components that, that go with that. So typically, I believe you would turn your issues over to the attorney general or to, to someone else. So. I just have some concerns about limited powers of a peace officer, if you could define that. Certainly, um, Vice Chair Carlton through um, Chairwoman Aldegi. Um, I, I I can understand what you're um, concerned about. Um, uh, the issue comes into play though, is that these particular um, folks need to actually get access to criminal justice information. So the limited, inform or limited powers we're talking about is 
getting some training so that they understand the confidentiality around all criminal um, information that they're provided, but it also allows them to share that information so that they can do investigations. The plan is, as you noted, to turn the actual um, litigation or enforcement over to the attorney general, but the, the group needs to have um, the power to actually pull criminal backgrounds and pull criminal information in order to perform their investigation um, strategies in order to perform or to send that information over to the attorney general to actually enforce. And that was that's my concern and that's why I had concerns about this fraud unit because I didn't want it turning into another police force. Um, so I, I, I have serious concerns about allowing folks access to that information. So uh, uh, it was my impression that when they got to a certain point, it was going to be turned over to the attorney general to do those background investigations and find out what was going on. So uh, that when we had these conversations at the beginning, it was never the intent for those positions to turn into de facto cops. So uh, I, have, I have some concerns about that. Thank you, Vice Chair. Vice Chair, did you need any follow-up questions? Okay, uh, we will then move on to Assembly Member Flores. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. I know you walked through a lot, and I don't know that there's any other way to really present that, so uh, it is what it is. Uh, I'm looking at the original language, and, and my understanding is in your amendment, there's no change to Section 59, is that correct? So as, as section 59 reads in the original text, that is how you intended to move? So, yeah, um, so um, something on Flores, I just wanted to verify before I answered you, sure. that is exactly how we have no amendments to that section. Okay, perfect. Um, and I wanted to make sure I asked that first, Matt, and now if I could follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, absolutely, Assembly Member Flores. Thank you. And so looking at the original language, uh, and I'm looking at page 59, um, and I'm looking specifically at lines 12, I see, uh, so specifically nine lines 8 through 12, or 14, 13, excuse me, lines 8 through 13, they talk about a captive insurer. And I see there that uh, you, you select uh, competence and experience satisfactory. And now you're you're referencing back to NRS 694C.210, and then and I see NRS 694C.210 just goes back to the requirements of a captive insurer. Um, and so I just wanted to understand what was happening. Oh, you muted yourself, Assembly Member oh, Floor. Sorry about that. A captive insurer has a set of criteria that they have to abide by pursuant to NRS 694C.210. And now you're saying that they, when they are employed or enter into a contract with anybody else, that other party has to then meet the same exact requirements. And so I, I just wanted to understand what was happening, why we're doing that. Um, and then based on your answer, I, I would have, I would like to have a follow up. Certainly, um, uh, uh, this is Barbara Richardson for the record. Some employers, um, basically it comes down to what we found was um, sometimes uh, there are folks who are in the business of insurance um, who um, have been unfortunately convicted of a felony um, and they come in through the side or through the edges, but there is a, a federal law 18 USC 1033, which does not allow um, anyone who's committed a felony of a financial um, uh, nature to be in the business of insurance, but there was really no way other than going to the captive um, company themselves to make sure that we weren't having affiliates um, uh, get into the, uh, the business of being supportive insurance uh, or insurance people um, that would still be considered in the business of insurance. Madam Chair, if I could have a follow up to that. Follow up Assembly Member Flores. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just for, for the clarity of the record, we're only trying to capture those folk because when I look at NRS 694C.210, I saw that there's a you know the whole host of items in there that 
we talk about when you go into that, uh, uh, when they go for that application process. Uh, and understandably, when I'm when somebody's entering into a contract or an obligation with somebody else, um, and you know, I, I'm I'm just thinking it through the lens of it may be something very relatively small and or not not as big uh, to where we would have the same exact criteria set in place. But if you're saying that the only intent is to capture those individuals who had a felony and they were coming in through uh, through this mechanism, then that makes sense. Um, so I just wanted to make that point clear. And then Madam Chair, in that same section, I wanted to follow up another another question. And, and assembly when Flores is Barbara just for the record, that that is uh, what we're in, the intention is, is uh, we don't want people to contract with folks to try to get around the, the statutes. Great. And then in that same section, I have one last follow up, Madam Chair, but I don't have to ask it. I know there's I mean, this bill is huge, so I can wait. No, please, Assembly Member Flores. I think it's beneficial Thank for all you. And so I'm saying on page 59 of the original language, and I'm looking at lines 27 through 33. And, and again, I had the same question because under NRS 679B.125, uh, when, when I was reviewing that, um, it talks about uh, that you have the commissioner may observe the conduct of each authorized insurer and other persons who have direct or material involvement. And then it talks about if they're unqualified, disqualified, and suitable person, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what we're doing here because you're saying the commissioner, line 27, the commissioner may periodically review the qualification of a natural person or business organization. But isn't that something you already can do? So I'm just trying to understand what you couldn't do before, because um, my understanding is you could do that already, and why we needed to clarify that there. And I just trying, and again, I'm just trying to understand what was happening that we're clarifying. Uh, so, Mr. Flores, um, Ms. Barbara, just for the record, basically what was going on is so we were getting information, and we have been getting information about accountants. Um, we've been getting uh, information about actuaries who are supporting. Um, the, the captive managers or the captive um, companies. And we've also been getting um, some information on the captive managers. Uh, the real issue came down to one, us being able to ask that question at some point is, you know, um, with, without having to actually, it sounds bad, but we, do, we don't want to spend our time actually doing, um, doing uh, background checks on these folks, we would like some kind of an attestation that um, the captives themselves are making sure that they are not, um, they're not um, contracting with somebody who can't be in the business of insurance. And sometimes that, that happens by, you know, finding out through other states, which we have a tendency to, and then asking the captive manager or captive companies to ask their captive managers, their actuaries, their accountants, just to um, to verify that they, they still qualify. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Flores, for your questions. Committee members, any questions? I'm gonna go into a full screen mode so I can see anyone that's raising their hands. Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you much, um, Madam Chair, and thanks for Thank you for working with stakeholders. Really appreciated um, the, the amendments and, and the complexity of, of everything that you have to do. This is, I think, my third time through the insurance omnibus bills. So um, I know that there's a lot here, and I, I appreciate all the work. Um, I, I believe we have a, a um, letter on the record that I'm um, just reviewing and I wondered if you could just, um, it has to do with self-insured groups and, and maybe just give a little background on the, um, the SIGs and, or SIC codes rather, and, and that have, were put in place when they first were authorized and then where we stand with that today. If you could just give me a little background, I'd appreciate it. Certainly a amount of tools. Um, so this is Barbara Richardson for the record. So the SIGs are not covered in any part of our bill. Um, so we haven't actually made any requests to make any changes to those statutes. Um, so I believe, I, I'm not sure if I've seen the letter you're talking about. I 
I have heard that there was a potential amendment that was going to be coming from a consorting group, um, but I, I would not feel comfortable in addressing that letter without actually seeing the letter. Absolutely. So my apologies. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. We'll just chat offline. Okay. And and I said, like, we're told, maybe they, um, I'm hoping maybe that organization is going to be on the line for testimony. Hopefully they, and then um, if they are, then I'll allow that you ask your question then to them too. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And one, one last question. And um, I, I know anytime we make changes to any sort of um, fees, even if they're lowering or, or raising, I think I saw um, sections in here. I just wondered if that made this a two thirds bill or, or if it's just a simple majority bill. I didn't see that on the amendment or the original. Yeah, Assemblywoman Tulsa, this is uh, Barbara Richards for the record. The intention was not to alter them, but to actually put them in a place where all the um, the different types of licensees could find them. Uh, because if you held one or more licenses, you sometimes had to search through statutory language to find the fees for one. And then the other ones were in the regular fees and taxes chapter. We were just trying to make it easier for everybody to find the information. Okay, thank you. So, so just to clarify there, therefore it, it's not a two thirds. No, no. Barbara Richardson for the record, no. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, not from our perspective. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just had, somebody had asked me, so I thought I'd, I'd make sure I got that clear on the record. Thank you. A great question, Assembly Member Tolls, and I will ask our legal uh, Mr. Sam Quast when he is available, maybe to get that information to us. If if in moving fees from one chapter to another chapter, it does make it a two thirds vote. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, um, any other questions? Okay, I do have a couple of questions, Commissioner Richardson, and I know we've worked long and hard on this bill for many, many months, and it's been a, a work in progress, and I do want to thank you for working with stakeholders and uh, I think alleviating a lot of the concerns uh, that they had and that I had as well. Um, I know one of my biggest areas of concerns was Section 2, because um, I just felt that it, it was eliminating any due process by revoking um, a license without a hearing and I, some of those concerns carry throughout the bill and I just wanna make sure, I, I think they're still in there. And so I just, I wanna ask again, because I didn't see them in the amendments, but this language I saw throughout the bill again, and it's been so long since our initial meeting that I just, I, I just need to ask um, to clarify for me and then for the record as well. But in many of the sections, there's language in here that addresses that if a licensee, the licensee is required to inform the commissioner of each change of address or electronic email address um, within 30 days. And if a licensee changes his or her business, residence, or electronic address, which would be an email, without giving written notice, and the commissioner is unable to locate the licensee after diligent effort, the commissioner may revoke the license without a hearing. And I still, I know we talked about that, and I don't know if maybe I missed it in an amendment, but I still have like really, um, heartburn about taking someone's license away without due process, without a hearing. And that's kind of what section two did and we deleted that. And so I kind of want you to address this, which is I found it in multiple sections and whether it was in the amendment and I just missed it. So this is Barbara Richardson for the record. Um, Chair Hauge, um, Hauge, oh, thank you for that question. Um, it's it's uh, it, it one of the section two was very confusing because some of the concerns about how Title 57 also worked with um, um, NRS 233, um, which is the um, general um, administrative code for um, how you handle certain types of issues. And under the statutes and the administrative code, we currently, if we can't find you and we've been trying to look for you and give you information as a licensee, and it usually happens at renewal time, um, there is a requirement to work through a diligent um, search, which we do do with using certified mail um, and any other process that we can possibly think of to try to find somebody who seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, and then there is um, a, a hearing um, that actually occurs under 233. And then we send a notice um, or, or we send a notice or we perform a, a hearing um, and then we take the license down based on trying to go through all of that. It, it takes months between the time that we determine that we can't find somebody and in the initial um, search for them. 
and the time that they would actually have a license going down. And all that time, uh, we are required to try to find them um, using any means possible. So, and uh, that's still in the statutes, so. I, and maybe you'll just need to send me what the steps are to help ease my concerns, because you said there was a hearing, but the language that you're, you said you're saying there currently is a hearing, but right now that the language that you're changing it to says, may revoke the license without a hearing. So you're taking that process out, that hearing that if they then don't show up to, then you can remove their license and this would change it to the fact that there wouldn't be a hearing necessary. You also mentioned that you guys send out notices like certified mail. How many pieces of certified mail do you guys currently send out? So this is Chairman Mahoney, this is Bob Richardson for the record. We attempt to send three um, different notices um, before we take any action. And are, are all three notices sent certified mail to all addresses associated with the licensee? No, the final notice is the one that sends certified mail to all the addresses, the known addresses. Um, prior to that, we'll use online services. And, um, and if they're potentially part of a producer group, sometimes we'll try to find them through that. Okay, and then so okay, I think I, I'm probably going to need to have more conversations with you about this area because I know that those were like some of the areas that I had the biggest concern with section two and section and, and this this language which we found in multiple sections depending on what license it was just because I just that not having that due process in there just gives me really big heartburn. Um, again, having someone having just sending one piece of certified mail if we add this language in it would just be one piece of certified mail and then we remove the hearing. And if someone doesn't respond, then they have a potential to lose their license. And that was as I was going through the license fee structure, some of the licenses are $60, but some of them are $250 and some of them are $1,300. So to have someone re, you know, lose their license and then have to reapply and pay those fees again, I think it's just, it just, I, I need to have more conversations about that because I don't feel comfortable with that language. Um, and, and I wish we could have had these conversations before, but we were limited with time. And so I'm glad we're able to have them now. I do just have concerns on another section as well. And I feel like this might have been amended. So you might answer my question, just point me to the right amendment. But again, one of the conversations we had before regarding if a licensee, um, and again, this is in multiple sections as well, depending for which licensee we're talking about. But all, the language says all fees paid by the applicant within the application for a licensee are non-refundable. Now that's non-refundable if you, they do not qualify for a license, correct? Why is it that we're no longer refunding licensees to licensees who may not qualify? Now someone getting their insurance producer license, you know, paying maybe $250 for a license, um, then, getting the, then getting denied for one reason or another, now they are out their $250 and they're also out the potential career that they thought they were gonna have to make money. So not when we, we're previously refunding those fees and now we're not refunding those fees again in another area because I'm thinking about who those people are who are trying to get it right. This might be just a, a young person forking out money to take classes to then take pay to take the exam, you know, and pass the exam to get their PNC license and then pay the $250 to get their property and casualty license, but then be denied. But then they're, they're not just out the licensee money, they're also out all of the money they invested in, in to getting to that point. So can you explain to me why we're no longer refunding them their license fee if they are not gonna be granted a license? Certainly, so this is Barbara Richardson for record. Um, Chair Haldi, um, the funds, uh, the, the license fees are already non-refundable except for the motor vehicle damage appraisers. Um, that's the only one that um, that doesn't specifically um, allow for refunding of our, I mean, it, it allows for the refunding of license. But to help you understand our general process for, um, for before we even take a fee from a, um, an applicant, for example, for a producer applicant, you can't actually um, finish your application unless you qualify in the first instance. So the only way that you would get through the door and end up having to pay a fee is if you actually lied on your application and, and uh, somehow said you qualified when in fact you didn't. So um, that's usually the issue that we've run into. Um, and that does mean that we've already done the processing on the application, we've already reviewed the application, but in order to actually get in the door online in order to, um, to pursue um, the application, you would have had to take a test um, and that would have given you the initial qualification. Then you would have had to fill out the form, which 
um, itself um, filters to make sure that you've filled out everything correctly and that you've provided all the information and that you actually, um, there's no um, incorrect or answer that's going to disqualify you. Again, as long as you've um, been honest in your application. Okay, so you're telling me every other licensee under this chapter um, has that same provision where their fees, if they are not qualified or approved for their license, don't get their their license refunded every single. So, Sharon Haldegi, um, this is Barbara Richards for the record. Um, uh, the, again, I will point out though that um, when you say qualification, you can't get past the front door. And so you never end up paying if you're not qualified. Okay, but then if someone were to, I mean, if they would apply, pay the fees for their license, then they would be qualified, right? Unless they lied on their application. This is Barbara Richardson for the record. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and I would say, I mean, I, I, I want to make sure that you guys do know, though, that the, there is an allowance for the return of erroneously collected fees. Like if there was an error or, or some error came in, into place, we would um, look for at a request for um, returning uh, erroneously collected fees. Uh, we have seen this sometimes where somebody um, submits twice for an application, um, but that's, you know, that's their money that goes back to them. So, okay, so I think that was it. I think we had kind of talked about all my other questions that I had, but okay, um, I'm gonna do one last check for questions for members. Okay, and my last thing that I'll say, um, Commissioner Richardson, I, I, I agree with uh, Vice Chair Carlton. I do have some concerns when when we look at peace officers and extending that, that I mean, I, I need to check with legal, but I need, I mean, Mr. Carlson brought up a good point by giving them limited powers of peace officers. Does that then move in them into categories where they qualify for certain, like benefits like heart and lung and what that will do to the cost for our local governments? So um, I'll check with our, our um, we'll check with our legal to see if you can help answer that question, because those are some of the I think the duties and that's what the attorney general's office is for. And that's why um, departments and boards are all issued DACs to help work with um, these certain scenarios. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I will move into testimony and support. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in support? Yes, Chair. To testify in support on AB 45, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in support on AB 45, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits of five, two, three, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Hadegui and members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark, that's T-O-M. C-L-A-R-K, and I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Association of Health Plans to present a friendly amendment to AB 45. In 2019, we worked with Senator Ratty on Senate Bill 234, and that bill created the process in NRS 679B.124, whereby insurance carriers would notify the insurance commissioner's office when a provider was denied credentialing into a network. The form letter devised by the DOI is sent to the division at the time of the denial. The process created some confusion. So we've worked with the commissioner's office on the amendment um, before you, and you'll see that the change to NRS 679B.124 allows the insurance commissioner to determine the frequency at which the health carrier shall submit a copy of the form letters. We believe that this new language will make the reporting more efficient and the process will be easier for the DOI to compile the information and to formulate the mandated report to the legislature. And finally, Madam Chair, I signed in to speak during a support portion of the hearing, um, but I need to state for the record that my members are reviewing the numerous amendments that were uh, put forward today. And uh, I'd like to reserve the ability to switch to opposition or neutral in the future. If that occurs, of course, I will definitely reach out to Commissioner Richardson and staff to uh, address those concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clark, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition? 
As chair to testify in opposition on AB 45, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 213. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Terry Chambers, and I'm here today representing the Nevada, <coughs> pardon me, Self-Insured Group Consortium. Uh, the consortium is comprised of seven associations of private employers and one association of public employers. Uh, Self-insured groups in Nevada provide workers' compensation coverage to nearly 3,000 Nevada workers and represent over, or, pardon me, 3,000 Nevada employers and represent over 60,000 of Nevada's workers. I am also the Director of Underwriting and Government Relations for Pro-Group Management where we manage five of Nevada's self-insured groups. In September 2019, I retired from Nevada's Department of Business and Industry Division of Insurance, where I was chief of the self-insured workers' comp section for more than 10 years. The consortium has been in communication with the Division of Insurance for several months regarding regulatory requirements, one of which is the requirement that self-insured groups maintain rating and reporting data using standard industrial classifications or SIC codes. In short, SIC codes are a holdover from the old state industrial insurance system or SIS. In fact, since 1997, SIC codes have become obsolete as they were replaced by uh, the North American Industry Classification System or NAICS. The consortium has proposed an amendment to NRS 616B.407 and has suggested that NRS 616B.410 be repealed. These statutes, which specifically require the use of SIC codes, were enacted in 1993 when self-insured groups were first permitted in Nevada. However, the use of SIC codes as well as the existence of SIS became obsolete when Nevada opened workers' compensation to private insurers in 1999. A proposed amendment to AB 45 was submitted to the Commission of Insurance for review on March 11, 2021. The proposed language would reinforce the commissioner's authority to regulate the rates of self-insured groups while eliminating the obsolete requirement for self-insured groups to maintain and use SIC codes in reporting to the Division of Insurance and in determining rates. We believe that the Division of Insurance and self-insured groups can only benefit by the amendments proposed and we respectfully request the committee's consideration. And as an added point, this is our only opportunity to change the statute. If the statute isn't changed during this session then for the next two years, uh, according to commissioner staff, we will be required to report using SIC codes, even though we're not prepared to do so. Uh, that completes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We do have a question for, for you from Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you, Chair, and thank you. Chair. Assembly Member Tolls, I, could you get closer to your microphone? I think you're you're, you're very faint. Sometimes I think my papers on my lap uh, mess up the microphone. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you, um, Ms. Chambers, for that testimony and, and for submitting it um, on Nella so we could review it. So I, I understand that the self-insurance came, um, came into being in 1993, uh, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, there are the SIC codes were enacted in 1993 when self-insured groups were first permitted, as you just said in your testimony. Um, but then they became obsolete in 1999. And so you're asking for this change now, and I'm just wondering, has this been something that you have been working on trying to get changed since 1999, or is there some reason why here in, in this session you'd like to see this changed I mean, I guess, have they been obsolete since 1999? 
and all this time, but we're just doing a change, or is there something new that I, I missed? And I apologize. Yeah, this is Terry Chambers for the record. Um, this is not this. There's no question that this is uh, these statutes should have been addressed a long time ago. I can only say that you know there the reasons for not doing that, having been at the division at that time, probably vary by commissioner and by session and what the needs were of the insurance division at that time. I can also tell you that at the time. Um, when I began to work in that section, the commissioner was accepting of the fact that, that, that it was no longer necessary for groups to report using FIC codes. And it was something that was um, accepted. And the commissioner at that time also did not have an appetite for any legislation that would open up 616B, uh, which was had to do with self-insured groups and self-insured employers. Um, the only reason that it's an issue now is because uh, commissioner staff has been um, very um, adamant about groups using FIC codes and adhering to those statutes quite literally. Um, as 616B407 actually has a provision that allows the commissioner to approve an alternative way to calculate rates, those, uh, that alternative has been rescinded. And staff has advised each of the self-insured groups that they would need to follow those statutes and they would have a year to comply. But even with a year to comply, that means that we would have to convert all of our processes uh, to, to SIC codes, which are meaningless to both the division and to the groups until the next session when we would have another opportunity to, um, to change the statute. So in answer, to answer your question, there's a multiple reasons why it was not addressed before. The reason it has become critical now is because uh, commissioner staff has been very adamant about um, adherence to the statutes as they are written. Thank you for that answer. And I guess my my next question would be for legal possibly, but I know that could be offline or, or perhaps the commissioner wants to answer, but um, the commissioner stated that this bill does not address those chapters. So I guess my question from legal is, um, would this open up that necessary chapter to address that, the NRS 616B.407? Um, if it's not in this existing bill, I just would love some clarification and maybe we take that offline. I believe that um, unless they were amended out of the bill, I think that there were uh, statutes within the bill that did address Chapter 616B. Um, and so I don't think it would be a problem to, um, to adopt the amendments that we're proposing. But if they had been removed by these recent amendments, then that would be another story. But um, that, and that is probably another reason why uh, for many years it didn't get taken care of because all of the other statutes for insurance and that are governed by the Department of in Division of Insurance are in Title 57. And this is you know, a completely separate chapter um, of statute. So it creates problems. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe we could just follow up with legal. Um, yes, Assemblymember Foles, I've already made, um, sent a message to um, confirm the information with Mr. Quast, our legal. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate the indulgence to just help wrap my mind around it. Okay. Um, broadcasting, if we could go to the next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Can we go to those wishing to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral on AB45, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. 
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. I would like to thank the Division of Insurance for meeting with the Chamber about this bill and the conversations we did have regarding AB 45 were productive. The Chamber was originally opposed to the bill as drafted because of the concerns associated with Section 2. However, with the proposed amendment presented today by the Division of Insurance, which deletes Section 2, we would be neutral with adoption of the amendment. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Moratkin, for your testimony today. Um, broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. And Commissioner Richardson, did you want to give any closing remarks? Uh, so this is Barbara Richardson for the record, and I appreciate that, Chairwoman Haldegi. Um, I, I know this is complicated, um, so if anybody has any questions and you want to reach me offline, please do so. Um, and just for your legal research, um, Section 77 and 80 through 85, where, um, where we're talking about industrial relations data, that um, was all removed under Amendment Number 11, if that helps your legal um, do their review. Okay, her moved under amendment number 11. Thank you. Okay, I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 45. Members, that brings us to our last item on the agenda, which is public comment. And we'll, while we are giving those listening over the internet time to call in, I'm just gonna go through our normal public comment um, housekeeping. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that public comment, <coughs> excuse me, is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. We have already given the public ample time to support or oppose legislation. We open and close hearings so that we can establish a record of public testimony on a bill. Therefore, public comment is not intended to be a continuation of a bill hearing. I will remind people that we do, those listening, that we do limit public comment to two minutes. And again, please address your remarks to issues that fall within the Commerce and Labor Committee. If you direct your remarks to issues that are outside of the scope of our committee, I will ask you to redirect your comments or terminate them. I will remind you to please be respectful of committee members and other witnesses. Do not comment on testimony provided by other speakers and do not make personal attacks. You may always submit written remarks for inclusion in the meeting record. With that broadcasting, is there anyone on the telephone line that wishes to give public comment? Thank you, Chair. To take your place in public comment, please press star nine now to join the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 074, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Madam Chair and Committee, my name is Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-I-E, Shepard, S-H-E-P-A-R-D. I am the AARP Nevada State President. On behalf of our 345,000 members across the Silver State, I would like to thank the committee for passing AB 190 unanimously and showing Nevadans the importance of family caregiving by enabling the family caregivers who are still working the ability to take care of their family members. Thank you. Thank you for your test or your public comment, Mr. Shepard. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the line? Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no more callers at this time. Okay, members, this concludes our meeting for today. Our next meeting will be on Monday. We will have meetings Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week. I do want to note that you should have received two agendas for Monday. We will be meeting at 1 p.m. on Monday with a second meeting taking place at 6 p.m. at night. So um, thank you, committee members. Enjoy your weekend. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.